So welcome to our virtual conversation um, on behalf of the Yonkermar Gardens Conservancy and the city of Yonkers. I've had the pleasure to stand on the shoulders of giants throughout my entire career. And for today's program, I'm gonna to try to rise the occasion and do the same again. I'd like to introduce um, our friend and partner in this conversation. His name is Toby Musgrave. Toby has a degree in horticulture and garden design and a doctorate in garden history. Um, he is English and he has a, the, the degree is in plants and a garden historian. He's an independent scholar, a lecturer and a design consultant. I'm reading this because it's quite an impressive resume. <clears throat> he is an author and co-author of 18 different books, including The Plant Hunters, An Empire of Plants, the Head Gardeners, which is certainly on my particular list at the moment, Paradise Gardens, Heirloom Fruits and Vegetables, Green Escapes, and the book we'll be looking at today, The Garden, Elements and Styles. Um, he lives in Denmark and he has a small historic garden and enjoys growing heirloom vegetables. And I'd like to bring Toby on. Oh, thank you, Timothy. Thanks for a lovely uh, introduction. And thank you very much for the invitation to be here today. No, we're really thrilled to have you. Um, this webinar is sort of replacing our early spring symposium, which we've usually, usually done. And we've had a symposium of panel guests and have put it together. And this year we were thinking about doing just what we're doing today, which is to do a, a walk through Untermeyer Gardens and sort of put all the elements that Untermeyer acquired and, and used within his garden and put those in more of a global context. And we saw your book, and I think there's a couple Untermeyer images in it, and thought if you and I had a conversation, we could do that exact same thing. So thank you for being here with us today. Pleasure. So I just wanna start with a brief introduction of the garden itself. Um, Samuel Untermeyer was as passionate about horticulture as he was about his successful and fairly progressive career in lawyering. Um, we started out, 10 years ago now um, with the Conservancy partnering with the city of Yonkers to put this project together. And our tagline was America's greatest forgotten garden. I think in two weeks, we might have as many visitors when we first started 10 years ago as we have with us today. So it's a pretty exciting time. Um, Untermeyer, as passionate about gardening as he was, he did need some help designing the garden and he hired William Wells Bosworth and in his notes, Bosworth's notes, he mentioned that Untermeyer walked into his studio and asked him to design the grandest garden in the world. So that was Untermeyer's stated ambition to his designer. And we do have a very early image, um, the only file we have of a Bosworth drawing of the garden. And if I step forward a little bit, we can see what those gardens look like today. So Toby, a very eclectic garden, what Untermeyer called his Greek garden, there's a grand vista, uh, color gardens, an old Italian vegetable garden, and the, the garden was just replete with all these different styles that Untermeyer put together between 1899 and 1940. And when we were going through your book, trying to define exactly what this garden would look like, um, and we see some befores uh, during Untermeyer's Chrysanthemum Festival, and the decline it suffered through the 70s, and some of the work that was being done, and then the sort of work we've been doing in the past 10 years to bring Untermeyer's vision back to prominence. But trying to figure out how this garden fits into categorization, Toby, we thought it might be a country place era garden. What do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, I think it, it fits in, um, certainly in terms of the chronology, um, in sort of 1890 to 1930 was the sort of peak of the country place era gardens. On the whole, they tended to be more east coast of, of America. There's certainly some in the west and, and in the mid as well. But um, that idea of these, these wealthy people uh, with more money than they knew what to do with, if you like, and then deciding that they wished to, to spend that on making a, an amazing house and garden complex, um, basically to show off. It was a super yacht of the day, uh, I guess you could say. Um, and so that sort of that design with, with people like Charles Gillette and Charles Adam Platt, uh, Frederick Law Olmsted, and, and Beatrix Ferrand doing these amazing gardens, but very eclectic, as you said, with this, this huge range of, of different inspirations, features, styles, elements, um, 
a lot of them sort of plundered from from the from their European tours, if you like. I mean, I guess you can draw a parallel with the the Italianate style that was so popular from sort of eighteen forties onward in in England, where it was just sort of you know pick and mix history, if you like. No, that makes a lot of sense. I've, I've always described this card as sort of a Yonkers eclectic, and so that certainly puts it in a much bigger perspective. So as we proceed, and we can see a map here of the current gardens, uh, the Italianate vegetable garden has now become a nursing home. The neighboring estate that was on the property is now the local hospital. But I think what we'd like to do is take a walk through this map, um, a virtual tour, so to speak, through the walled garden and down the vista and over to the gatehouse and make our way back up to the Temple of Love and the Rock and Stream Garden. And we'll start off by looking at the elements that in the past 10 years we've actually been able to restore back to, to Untermeyer's vision with maybe some influence along the way. And perhaps you can help me put all these different elements into context as well. So we'll start with looking at these elements and styles restored. And we'll start here in the walled garden, which Untermeyer actually described as a Greek garden, um, but it certainly is a formal garden, if nothing else. And I think you could describe the style as such, Toby. Yeah, I think so. I mean, looking at the at the, at the, the layout of it, and we'll talk about that in a little more detail in a minute. But you know, formal geometric straight lines, um, as opposed to informal with the curvaceous sinuous lines. I mean, they're two sort of major. Uh, differences in stylistic approach to to gardens. I mean, the picture that you're looking at now is is of an Italian Renaissance garden, but very much that idea of you know neat straight lines uh, and geometry, whether it's symmetrical or asymmetrical, and that's certainly the the case in this wall garden. Absolutely. So if we step back and and look at this walled garden again, Untermar called it his Greek garden. So it's this. I, I describe it as an Indo-Persian walled garden surrounded by a study of Greek architecture. And so all these different influences going back to that eclectic style, that country place era that we were speaking of. Um, but you can see the, the walls as it goes down, there's two different terraces to this particular garden. So it allows us as gardeners to approach two different styles within the garden. Um, but just walled gardens in general, if we can put that in context. Yeah, I mean, I think people generally think of wall gardens in terms of productive gardens, vegetable gardens, kitchen gardens, and that idea that you had that productive space and the walls gave that level of protection and a microclimate. But they're also a very good way of creating um, a, a defined space within a garden. Uh, if you want to create a different feature, whether it's a, a courtyard garden, if it's a small one, we'll talk about that later as well. But walls give you that sense of privacy and also that idea of, of a sense of discovery, which I think is is always important in a garden. No, it, it does do a lot for us. And, and to get into these walls of the garden, we have this really grand tower, a really grand gate. Um, this one has a relief sculpture of Artemis. Um, I, I, I make this association a bit too much, but but from a gardening point of view, Artemis Latin name is Artemisia, which is a plant that unfortunately is one of our probably top three invasive plants in the garden, um, the mugwort or Artemisia. So I sort of curse her name every time I walk through this gate. Um, but the purpose of gates in gardens in general? Again, I think it's, it's that idea of, of, of providing a sense of progression. I think the one at, uh, in your garden, it almost reminds me of an ancient Egyptian uh, garden. There was always that huge gateway when you came into ancient Egyptian garden. So maybe that's another uh, classical element to, to toss into the mix there. But I mean, the, the pictures here again, it's you can use a, a, a gate doesn't have to be a, a solid visual block, although that's one way of sort of sense of surprise, opening the gate, moving on. But you can use it very much as a way of defining uh, the theme of where you're leaving or where you're progressing to. Um, obviously, perhaps uh, a famous use of gates is the moon gate, the bottom left one there, you see it in, in Chinese gardens. And the bottom right one, I think, is just a piece of fun. Someone's taken a load of old uh, gardening tools and welded them together to create a sort of gateway between two compartments. But again, it's that way of compartmentalizing the garden, giving uh, structure, theme, mood, and uh, a sense of progression as one moves through. I do certainly feel we transform as we step in through that gate into the garden. And here we're looking at an overhead shot from the top of that same particular gate of Untermar's garden in its prime during a chrysanthemum festival. You can see the, the bedding of chrysanthemums along the canals or the rills, as we'll discuss here in a bit. 
but very much a, a formal garden divided into four quadrants um, with lots of different styles. If we take a look from overhead, we really get to see the layout and the design of this garden as Wells Bosworth intended it to be. And stepping down into the garden, um, we play along these formal axes as well. And so there's definitely influences in this garden, Toby, if you, if you could help me decipher those. Yeah, I mean, it, it looks to me very much as, a, as an inspiration drawn from the great Mughal gardens uh, of India, which are an expression of the Islamic um, garden form, which is still with us today. Um, the whole concept of the, Itali of the uh, uh, Islamic garden is that it's a representation of the afterlife paradise made on earth. Uh, following the blueprint that's um, that's readable in the Quran, described in the Quran, so this idea of dividing the garden into four quarters, often with with canals, um, it's not a, an exclusively Islamic idea. I mean, if you take a step back, it also appears in Christianity uh, and the Christian um, creation narrative. That idea of Eden uh, and the four rivers flowing out of the garden in Eden. It's not the Garden of Eden, just to be pedantic. Um, and if you go to the Closest Museum, for example, in Upper Manhattan, you can see there uh, the, the quadripartite fourfold garden form. But in this case, it's very much uh, the Islamic garden. And it has a name in, in, in Islamic garden making. It's the Shah Bagh, which literally means four gardens. Um, you use those rills or paths to divide the, the space into four. And I think one of the things I love about Islamic gardens is that A, they are historic, B, they're completely contemporary, and C, it's, it's, a, it's a design form that you can be incredibly uh, ingenious with. I mean, whether you're going from the huge Taj Mahal on the top right-hand side to an English uh, version in Sezincote, and if my father's watching, I have to thank him for that picture, um, to on the left-hand side, a very contemporary example made by a British designer. Uh, Tom Stewart Smith in in Morocco a few years back. So it's a it's a style that's very much with us and 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 beautiful. No, it really is great to to see this garden now become so intimate with, and these design styles used in such different ways. Uh, I think your book really does highlight a lot of that very well for us. Um, so the elements that actually create this quadripartite or the charaba um, are these very strong axes that we have within the garden here at Untermeyer. Um, it's a bit more technical, but thinking about exactly what these axes do and how we can employ those in a garden. Here we can see Untermeyer on the east-west or the short axis as it goes over to our Temple of the Sky Rotunda and the Hudson River and the New Jersey Palisades in the background. I, I do have to point out in the foreground, you can see one of our gardeners, Drew Schuyler, there working on a wisteria as, as the drone flew by. But, but let's talk about access a little bit, Toby, and how, how we can use that in all gardens. Yeah, I mean, that comes also back into uh, what we were talking about, that uh, design uh, element of formality, if you like. You need, I mean, I suppose the best way you can describe axes, whether it's a main axis or cross axes or sub axes, is it's almost like the clothes uh, hangers, if you like, on which you hang the design. So you use these main lines uh, as, as ways of defining the space, but also guiding progressing through a garden. Uh, you can use them very much for uh, both physical uh, progression through the garden, enticing people to walk a certain way, uh, and you can also use them as a way of to draw the eye to particular elements with, within the garden. I mean, perhaps the biggest and best example is Versailles. You stand on the terrace at Versailles, you look down the main axis, the tapestry bed, and it disappears off into infinity. Uh, and once you've got that main axis, you know, you can make it as long as you like, doesn't matter. Uh, how short or how long it is, and then within that, once that main axis is established, you can start to play around with cross axes, terraces, and what have you. It's just a, it's a, a very good tool uh, for creating formal structure, and particularly in a small space, actually. And, and one thing I've always enjoyed about any time I'm in a garden axis, and I think I learned this from a really good, great garden photographer, is that you should always consider as a visitor or, or as a viewer of the garden, consider the axes on both sides. And I think that's a good lesson, not only as a visitor, but as a designer or a gardener, that while you have a, a main approach to any axes, you should, you should certainly go to the opposite end and, and consider the perspective from the opposite direction. Yeah, absolutely. Turn around and take a look from the other way. It's, it's always different when you look backwards. And also things like axes, I mean, you can use really clever techniques. So at the end of, of an axis, you can put something like an eye catcher, a focal point, 
Uh, and then when you get to the focal point, you suddenly find that there's another cross axis that takes you off in another direction. So you can play all sorts of, of optical tricks, uh, particularly change levels as well. So these axes in Untermeyer are defined specifically, but by what we've always, since we started this garden, called canals, and they're terminated by these marble basins. But as I was looking through your book and we were starting to discuss um, some of these terms and, and elements, you were telling me a canal is something you swim in. And so, so enlighten me there and, and, and inform me about a rill, which is maybe what we should be calling our element. I think there's a lot of these these discussions where it gets a sort of level of minutiae and and to be honest that's one of the reasons for the book um is to to bring out these 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 different themes these different elements these different styles and and name them and i think from knowing uh what a feature is and what it looks like um you know the book is hopefully inspirational if people are looking to create gardens but also when you're visiting gardens if you know what uh, you're looking at it just gives you so much more uh, as a visitor but yeah, it's really a matter of scale. I mean, wills uh, tend to be smaller, narrower water courses, um, and they can either be straight line uh, or they can be curvaceous. Um, the bottom picture on the right-hand side here is, is a beautiful English garden that's created with an Islamic influence in um, on Isha uh, by William Walton. But um, that idea of using a, a sinuous, narrow water course uh, to maybe follow a path. There's a lovely one in a garden, a landscape garden in, in Britain called Rausham, where you have a sinuous path walking through, moving through a, a shrubbery, dark green shrubbery, and down the middle runs this little narrow watercourse, and it's just just delightful. Um, and I think also when you look at Islamic gardens, they tend to be to be narrower uh, courses uh, that tend to be called rills. I mean, canals tend to be much larger. Um, whether you want to go swimming in them is, is another matter, but things like <laughs> at Versailles, uh, canals in Dutch style gardens, they tend to be to be to be larger, longer. But uh, similarly with with rills, you can also have uh, canals that are informal. They don't have to be in a straight line. And uh, the two top examples are bottom left hand one is actually a garden in Denmark, which is a a, a landscape garden which is is taking the English landscape into Denmark and, and with these beautiful uh, mirroring canals that wind through the garden as you explore them. And another thing um, oftentimes with rills is that you have moving water. Uh, the water jumps, moves, um, there's basins or what have you at either end, maybe with Islamic gardens you have jets going into it. One of the other things I'd say that perhaps defines a canal is it tends to be still. I mean, yes, Versailles has a big fountain at the end of it, but um, with canals on a larger scale, you get that lovely mirroring effect on a still day, uh, whether it's a, a, a feature of the garden that's reflected or whether it's the sky reflected or just a sort of ripple on the water. Uh, is a beautiful effect on, on on canals if you have the scale to to work with them. Sure, and I must say we do have fountains in our canals, or or maybe I should say rills, and uh, we do enjoy the moments in the morning when the gardeners arrive before the fountains come on, and and that particular reflection as well. So you mentioned the canals um, often have basins that terminate them, and and we certainly do at Untermeyer. This is a picture, obviously, or, or hopefully, obviously, after Untermeyer stopped gardening, when when these basins were filled with an annual planting. Um, I'm not sure that's exactly the the intended use of, of the particular basins, and here we have where we've actually put the plants around the basins at Untermeyer in a contemporary shot. Um, but basins can be used beyond the use in, in a big formal garden in a canal or along a rill. Yeah, I mean, I'm looking at the ones that uh, that Untermeyer put into his garden. I mean, they they really remind me uh, of, 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 say, an influence by somewhere like um, the Alhambra or particularly the Generalife in, uh, in Granada, Spain, the Islamic uh, Moorish influence in, in Spain, which Again, it's sort of a, I think it's kind of interesting when you look at history. You can say that that um, the Islamic influence came into Spain and affected Spanish gardens. It then went to you know America and the West Coast through uh, the colonization by the Spanish, and then came up into the uh, the mission gardens and that whole sort of Spanish colonial revival in the ninth turn of the 20th century. So again, threads running through history, I think, is kind of fun. But yes, basins are a great uh, a great feature. In this case, they're they're part of a, a added interest to the, a large feature. But in smaller gardens, again, you know, just a basin of, of water uh, with or without fountains, different scales, different styles, they just add a sense. And I think all gardens just are gorgeous with water. It's, it's one of those elements that brings so much to a, 
to a space, you know, the sound, the, 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 the lovely light reflecting off the water or the, the plashing of a fountain. Um, it just, it just, yeah, it's such a diverse dynamic element that uh, every garden should have. Uh, I agree. I had a small terrace when I lived in the Bronx in New York and I had a couple water basins there and it just transformed the space entirely. Um, speaking of transforming the space, um, some of the plantings that have happened within our walled garden, um, and we, we can talk about bedding. I, I sort of called this the tulip tragedy of the 1950s. It, it certainly is an exuberant bedding style. Uh, the geometry sort in the lawn sort of baffles me, and it also baffles me. I have an inset on the left-hand side of this slide where there was actually a bronze plaque from the Yonkers Historical, so Historical Society dedicated to this planting of tulips, which as we know, tulips certainly don't perennialize very well, not the big Dutch hybrids, but we have this plaque that will remain forever on the walls of the garden um, commemorating this bedding scheme. But, but bedding schemes can still be used today, and they are, and, and I, you have some amazing images of some bedding schemes in your book. Yeah, I think, I mean, the bedding concept really was what is those great Victorian ideas in 19th century Britain. It was um, it was a sort of movement where you had to show that the garden was a work of art, not an imitation of nature, which had been in the 18th century, those more natural than nature capability brand landscapes that you couldn't tell were actually a designed space. So in 19th century, it was very much, you know, we have to show the hand of man in the garden. And one of the ways you could do that was by using plants that were not native. If they weren't native, they weren't natural. And if they weren't natural, therefore they had to be artistic QED. Um, so bedding schemes just became an obsession in the, in the well, from the 1840s onwards, right up until the, to the 1890s. Um, and the bigger, the more brash, the more clashing colors. You could show your wealth by the size of your plant list. Um, and then they run into tens up to the hundreds of thousands. And it's one of those things that's always hung around. Um, love it or hate it. I think it's like garden gnomes. You love bedding or you hate it. Um, and it doesn't have to be formal. That was the way it used to be. But the pictures uh, that they're showing there, I mean, the one on the on the left hand side is a, is a huge uh, annual garden or bedding garden in Dubai, believe it or not, where it's just going crazy with these millions of plants every year. And I should have think where all the water comes from, but that's perhaps another story. Um, <laughs> top right there is Kirkenhof, that wonderful bulb festival every year in Holland. And that's just showing sort of drifts of bedding. So a very much more informal way of flowing it through the, the wooded landscape. And the bottom is, is a, a, a historic landscape given a new spin with uh, modern planting, again, block planting. But I, I don't know, I like bedding. I think it sort of, it brings a seasonal change to the garden and, and it's a bit of fun. Sometimes it can get a bit vulgar, a bit over the top, but you know, garden's supposed to be about fun. And I think bedding is one of those things that, you know, we can have a bit of play, play around, have a bit of fun with. Although I do agree, I, I think your garden looks much better without the tulips. Well, I mean, we do play with the bedding and and I think you're right to, to use plants that may not always be natives in, in small and certain ways to bring a lot of color into the garden is something we still want to do. And, and Untermeyer did a lot of big bedding schemes as we described already in his garden. And I think our variant on that is still to use tropical plants and get lots of color. It adds a seasonal interest to the garden, but we maybe like to use it a bit more delicately, but still trying to be brash with that. So it's still using these, these annuals in an annual planting, but maybe just not in the big bedding scheme way. I think with a bedding scheme, you can understand it very quickly. It's, it's very entertaining for a moment, but when you can use annuals in a, a slightly more sophisticated or mosaic way, um, there's something to be said for that. Oh, you're right. I think it's far more sophisticated. I mean, bedding plants are annual plants. They tend to be tender annuals and, and come out between the, the, the frost ending and the frost starting, except for tulips, which I guess are spring bedding uh, and also other bulbs. But I think what would define bedding is, is that use of mass blocks of color, you know, the big, bold brash in your face, oftentimes within a geometric framework of, of beds or, or borders. But using annuals, as you say, whether they're tender annuals or hardy annuals, to create a seasonal interest in a garden is, is, is a lovely way of doing it. Um, and actually, believe it or not, the, the, the main picture on the spread here is a garden um, way north. I'm in Denmark, and this picture is taken way north in Norway. Wow. Um, crazy island uh, where you can go out of, from, uh, I think it's from Bergen, and you take a boat out there, and they just create this fantasy land every year from 
thousands and thousands and thousands of, of, of tender annuals. Um, and and just it's just fun. And it's it's it is more subtle uh, and it's a more, as you said, a sort of tapestry effect. So, you know, it's just different ways of using similar types of plants. Mm, sure. And and one thing I always say, because we change our, our annual planting every year, is that we can be really bold and 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 maybe make a mistake and that mistake only lasts a few months and we have another year to do it and if i'm lucky i'll get to do 20 or more of these annual plantings every year at untermeyer before i'm done working but stepping back in a bit to the architecture at untermeyer again looking from the west across the the small axis toward the east we have what we've always described as a doric in the different uh Corinthian architectural themes, a Doric stoa. And I was surprised and interested in your book to see you describe um, this same feature as an excedra. Yeah, I mean, I think there's sort of the idea of excedra and there's, particularly in the garden context, when you start taking, as it were, architectural features uh, that are perhaps more domestic and then fitting them into a, a garden setting, sometimes you end up with quite a, a variety of, it's quite difficult to actually define what's what. Um, but the idea, I, I, I took the definition of as et cetera, as a, as a room where you, you, it's a place to sit outdoors. Um, so in this case, I think you can use it as, as that, uh, uh, the, the description uh, for that. And you can see the, the picture at the bottom left there is, is, um, is Undermeyer. Um, it's also, it also tends to be used as a feature at the end of a, of a focal point or an alley. Um, the top right one there is that garden I was talking about in, in Britain, Rousham. Uh, and there is actually a gallery uh, affair where you almost like have sort of etceteras ne put next door to each other with niches in. So it's sometimes kind of hard to um, what what is what is one man's poison and another, is another man's sort of potion, if you like. So there are particularly within gardens, there are no. Sometimes it's difficult to define exactly what a, a, an element is. But in this case, I would say that you know that's a place to sit outside. It's it's almost an outside door, outside room, if you like. It's a Roman concept. Uh, popular now that certainly works to me and i'll confess to our etc our stoa faces directly toward the hudson river and the west and the setting sun it's the ideal place to take the garden in for a sunset um so in that same place untermeyer at one time had 90 plus sculptures throughout the garden and he really used this as a place to highlight sculpture all those sculptures disappeared or were absconded with over the years. And so we've really turned it into a bit of a container garden, which bridges the either side of our, our eastern border and, and, and brings it all into focus a little bit. Um, so we're, we use containers throughout the garden and, and containers can just add such a different element to any size garden. Absolutely, and and you know, it's, the use of containers is as, as good as your imagination is. I mean, there's always plants you can use for wherever you are, but the idea of what you put those plants into in terms of what a container is, is, is just it lets, allows you to let your imagination loose and also to establish a theme or a feel for that particular part of the garden. Plus, as we were just talking about, add a, a seasonal a dimension to it. Um, and I, I love containers, except when I'm going on holiday and I have to find someone to water them. Um, that's right. their only drawback I find at container gardening. But again, that sort of idea of, of you know, whether it's a, an old wooden crate or it's a Wellington boot or it's an old toilet, um, you know, or a beautiful terracotta vase that's 500 years old from Florence or, or you know, whatever you want to use, a lead urn or whatever to, to add that dimension. And I think the other thing I like about containers is it's it can also be about the container itself. Um, uh, that combination of the plant and the container can really bring a, a dimension to a garden. And also, as you were saying, maybe with your little garden in, in, in the Bronx, that idea that you can bring so much into a small space by by using containers and whether it's ornamentals and all, all vegetables or herbs. No, absolutely. And then stepping beyond containers a little bit, and I've kind of treated this entire walled garden as a container, just so to speak. When we arrived 10 years ago, there was almost no planting. Um, but here we're looking at the amphitheater, which I, I kind of treat it as its own container. And, and we try to be very exuberant and theatrical with our, our container plantings within this space. Um, it's very fascinating part of the garden. Um, it's ionic in its architectural detail. We believe that 
Bosworth was inspired by Gardens in Filoli, which you see on the bottom left of the columns um, for the Manship sculptures that he put on top of these Cipollino marble columns in the center of the amphitheater. And I have a close up on the right, and if you squint in the background, you can see two more Paul Manships with Acteon and Diana in it. But uh, this is obviously during Untermeyer's fall season. You can see the chrysanthemums draping over into the reflecting pool and every crenellation in the back of the amphitheater has an individual pot. Talk about watering. I, I would imagine that takes two or three times a day on a warm fall day to keep that hydrated. And sort of what we've done with it now, you can see the Paul Manship sculptures in the foreground. We always try to fill this place up with lots of tropical containers um, and give it a, a bit of a, a, a big con container garden feel to it. And um, Amphitheaters can serve a lot of different purposes besides just sitting, and 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 they're used throughout many gardens. The Scott Arboretum where I worked, I think that there are amphitheater is why I applied for a job there. Yeah, I think the uh, the amphitheater, I think it's perhaps an underused element. I mean, I think from certainly when putting this book together, um, the one at Untermyer is perhaps one of the most iconic worldwide, and certainly one of the most sort of iconic features of 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 the garden. And I like that idea of of of, of changing levels with uh, an amphitheater. I like that idea of actually bringing the theatricality into a garden. Um, the picture here is actually Arnie Maynard's garden in the UK. He's a, a well-known designer. Um, and I, again, it's it's a very subtle way of, of instead of just having a slope down to that uh, the little creek that runs or the little uh, stream that runs through his garden, he's kind of just terraced it with grass terraces into an amphitheater. And almost like a stage just to the left hand side of the house. Um, again, it's something that goes back way, way back um, into history. There were some huge amphitheaters made at various gardens, uh, landscape gardens in the early part of the 18th century uh, yeah, within the UK. And then it kind of went from fashion. And I, I think it's one of the things you actually have to have quite a lot of space for. Um, but again, one of the interesting things I was finding when I was researching for the book is that quite a lot of university campuses now are starting to install uh, amphitheaters, uh, not only for dramatic performances, but actually as a teaching space, which I think almost goes back to that whole idea of, uh, of, of peripatetic teaching back in, in ancient Greece. But, you know, I think it's a lovely feature. And, and you know, I know we're going to come on to some lovely slides as to why an amphitheater is a good idea in a garden. Yes, yeah, so we're pretty sure uh, Samuel Untermeyer had the amphitheater built for his wife, Minnie Untermeyer, who was a huge patron of the arts, and she often had performances in the amphitheater. Um, very early avant-garde theremin concerts, um, when the theremin was, was treated um, in a quartet fashion. And then throughout Untermeyer's era, the Isidore Duncan dancers in those diaphanous gowns performed many times throughout the garden. Um, and this past summer, actually, we had the current Duncan dance troupe come and perform a live performance during COVID, which was really special, um, perform in that amphitheater this summer for us. And I think, yeah, coming back to this idea of theatrical, and there, there, is, uh, there is the feature in the, in the book. I, I love that idea of, of, of introducing theatre into, into a garden, whether it's real proper drama in terms of actually having players on the stage, or whether just, just upping the ante and, and creating something theatrical. And I, I kind of draw a line between, or a distinction between theatrical, which is sort of features and elements, and maybe exotic, which you could apply to the, perhaps the planting. Um, and I think, again, it's something that's perhaps a little underused. Um, and I think, Coming back to that idea, dear, and it, when I saw the pictures that um, that you showed me, Timothy, of the, of the dancers in the garden, I love that idea of being able to introduce different art forms to a garden. I mean, we all know that gardens, or we should all know that gardens are art forms in their own right, certainly ornamental gardens are. But then to add another dimension to that, whether it's a, a dance performance or a musical performance or fireworks or whatever, that extra dimension that you can use this outdoor space for always bring something special to the garden. And you could say the same about lighting a garden at night or adding some sound effects to a garden. But I also think that we always have to remember when we're in a garden, whether it's our own or visiting one, that we're players on a stage. Um, to understand a garden fully is, is to be in that garden. Um, it's lovely to see pictures like this and it's lovely to put the book together. 
but to fully understand and appreciate a garden, I think you really have to be in it. You have to be a player on that that stage that is the garden, and then you get to understand the garden so much more uh, deeply, if you like. And again, it changes with the seasons, that organic nature of gardens, and or the day as well, if the, with the weather changing. No, abs absolutely, I agree with that 100%. What a great sentiment. Um, to move through this space and to work through this space and see people enjoy it and, and then to add performance and music to it, it, it really is a transformative experience in so many ways. Um, another transformative view is in front of the amphitheater and you can see those manship sculptures and the Cipollino columns in the background. We recently were able to restore all the canals and reflecting pools in the garden and I don't believe Untermeyer ever really used them for planting but we've really turned that into a water garden. Um, it may be too big to be considered a water feature, um, but the idea of, of putting large pools and elements into the garden and, and using those as a planting space, is that what you're thinking with water garden? I know we talk about water feature as well, which we'll look at, but I'm just curious the difference between what we might call a water garden and a water feature. I suppose if we go back, we could say that uh, a real is a small water course, uh, a canal is a slightly wider or bigger water course. And I think a water garden is where you start to play with, with the forms and geometry to, to use water as a, a medium or an element uh, that adds a dimension to the structure of a garden. So in this case, it's absolutely, a, a, I would say, a water garden. Uh, the idea is that you're, you're bounding that water by a particular form, a particular structure. Uh, to give it a, a sense of, of shape, a sense of form, uh, and then maybe flowing it between different levels using uh, using water shoots or various other cascades or what have you. Um, so I think that idea of, of using a sort of largest expanse of water but giving it a very defined form and feel um, is what I would say a water garden is. Um, when you're coming onto water features, I'd say those were smaller elements, either independent or integrated within a water garden. Absolutely. And so this is just a, a small cross section of our, our big, what I'm thinking, water garden. I don't think we have any small water features, but but again, I think the use of a water feature, um, a little bit different than a basin, largely because there's moving water in it. Yeah, usually, I mean, basins oftentimes have, have a water flowing into them and flowing out, but they're usually quite calm. There may be a little bubbler or something, particularly in an Islamic uh, basin. But I, I kind of think water features are a, a small scale. Again, inspiration comes from all sorts of different ways. You can you can be very innovative. You can be very simple. I love that top right hand side one, which is just basically a rock that's been cut in half and then uh, scraped out to create this a little small water table, if you like. Um, and water features, I think, are, are a way of sort of uh, enlivening a space or enlivening a compartment within a garden bringing that dimension of, of, of fluidity, of sound, of motion, um, all those things that sort of catch the, the senses, if you like. Um, and again, it can also be a very calm thing. Um, we have one of the, the basins in the Japanese garden at the bottom left-hand side, that, that idea of washing your hands before you go in to, to, to do the tea ceremony. Um, it just adds that sort of dimension to, to a garden. So water features on the whole tend to be smaller scale. And as I said, they're going to be a standalone or they can be part of a, a water garden. Sure. Um, so stepping away from the water a little bit, looking at the historical Corinthian um, rotunda, what we call the temple of the sky, certainly the, 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 the largest architectural element within the walled garden at Untermeyer. Um, it, it does serve as a temple and I'm curious about that a little bit, but we can see that this temple, the mosaic underneath fell apart after Untermeyer without any real maintenance, and we've been working on that, but the entire temple is currently under reconstruction and restoration. This is a, a contemporary shot of, of how the temple looks at the moment. Um, and then we can see looking through the temple out at the Palisades and the Hudson River in a fall scene. And so this temple, which I'm curious uh, about just the architectural background, but also provides a, an amazing borrowed landscape in the background and frames it quite nicely. But 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 temple make I mean rotunda makes sense to me, but but explain to me where we come up with these secular elements and calling them temples, Toby. I think I mean yes, this is the rotunda. Um, perhaps without the capping on the top, I'm not sure if it did originally. 
I think the idea of, of temples really, again, is one of those ones that comes into the British landscape or the English landscape in the early 18th century. Um, there was a, a big movement away from the very sort of Baroque formal gardens uh, such as Versailles that had also become a very big fashion in, in British, uh, sorry, I should say English uh, at that time, gardens in the late part of the 17th century. And then in the early 18th century, there was a sort of rejection of things French, partly because Britain was at war with France again. Uh, so you didn't want to be looking as if you were imitating the enemy. Uh, but there was also a, a, a new look at nature and saying, well, let's use nature as an inspiration rather than all this geometry, this formality, these straight lines and, and axes and what have you. And one of the early expressions of that uh, more naturalistic approach to, to landscape was to take inspiration from the classics. So paintings from people like uh, Poussin and Claude, uh, these landscape paintings, which had a very classical elements to them with the buildings and the people doing their things as, as per, per mythology. Uh, and there was a designer called William Kent who kind of took those two dimensional paintings and made three dimensional artworks of gardens. And many of those gardens had things such as temples and other classical buildings within them. So the so temple really came into fashion in the early part of the 18th century in the English landscape garden, by that time British art. But it was also a, 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 a way of showing your classical learning uh, and also playing out with allegory within the garden, depending on whose temple it was, which god or goddess. But also they were used. These were places where people would, would meet, they'd have political meetings, they might entertain their mistress and this and the other. The two left-hand side ones there are two temples uh, uh, of love, uh, one at Stowe and one at um, West Wickham Park. And West Wickham Park is a, perhaps the most libidinous landscape I've ever come across. Um, it's mercury in the rotunda on the top of there. Mercury was the cure for syphilis. So when you're looking at the Temple of Love, I'll, I'll leave you to decide what that's representing. Um, but then I guess temples kind of fell out of fashion a little bit. It was like, you know, things came and went. And again, there's this, this crossover where we're talking about um, defining exactly what a temple is, exactly what a rotunda is, uh, exactly what all these particular buildings are. Sure. Sometimes they're called temples just because a temp they said the Temple of Apollo sounds better than the Rotunda of Apollo, if you're trying to be yeah. It, it does. It does certainly sound better. There's no doubt about that. So it's, this temple frames a borrowed landscape, and I think anytime you have a chance to include a borrowed landscape, if you're yeah. lucky enough to have it, I think that's great. But I think another idea of borrowed landscape that strikes me is if you don't have a nice view from your garden, and this can be your home garden, that whether it's in, enticing your neighbors to plant plants to screen their their air conditioning unit or or their back door that that a borrowed landscape should be thought about whether you have something to embrace or actually something you need to eliminate from your purview yeah i think so i mean i i think whoever has a borrowed landscape that they can draw on to to bring into their garden is is truly blessed uh, but oftentimes you know if you're creating a garden i mean that whole genius loci the genius of the place you want to create the garden in the place where you can best use that view. I mean, it's it's a, a, a technique that's been used across the world. The Japanese are particularly in, uh, have a strong tradition of using borrowed landscapes uh, without their gardens. Uh, and these are the some examples here of, in, in America and um, Snowdonia and in, in Provence. Um, and it's something that one should look at. And I like your idea that if you're if you don't if you don't have something nice to look at, then hide it and screen it. And maybe one of the things you can do there is use that idea of a trompe l'oeil, have someone come in and paint a uh, a three-dimensional painting to make your garden look bigger than it actually is. Sure, that that could be useful. So we, we don't have that problem at Untermeyer. Our, our garden's plenty big, and I'd like to step down to the vista, which uh, again uses the borrowed landscape we're so lucky to have sitting up on the hillside. This is uh, standing in one of our lower loggias um, or arcades, looking toward what we call the vista. Um, Untermeyer had this designed from an inspiration of the Della Vista in Lake Como in Italy, but stepping up to the gate and looking in, you can see what this garden ended up being without Untermeyer's 60 gardeners and other help caring for this particular landscape and what we've been able to bring it back to in the past 10 years, recreating the vista and the view down to the river and framing of the ancient Roman columns. So, Technically, I think this would be more called an alley if we weren't calling it a vista. 
again, I think it's one of those things where you, you, you've got a lovely element in the garden here, which has a whole range of different features and styles and elements as part of it that come combined to create this great idea. And again, this plundering of ideas from around the world. I mean, we've had just about every single classical um, civilization in the wall garden, and now we've gone to Italy and we're nicking stuff from Italian Renaissance gardens. Um, I think it's the Villa d'Este and the Villa d'Este at Lake Coma rather than the Villa d'Este at Tivoli, uh, which has this lovely uh, long walk down this alley. And, and then in that one, it has that water rills running down either side of the, uh, the, the path. But the idea of an alley is, and again, it's a very effective connecting and you can say that an alley is also a, a, an, a, an, an axis. You can put an alley on an axis. But alley is, is technically basically a walkway where you have it flanked by uh, trees or shrubs or both. And in this case, um, the left-hand side one has got trees and then topiary uh, and a wild meadow at the bottom. Um, Sorry. Oh, no worries. Um, but I think it's also one of those things where um, on the right-hand side, it's more formal and more contemporary view. But the idea is to guide the the, the view, uh, if you like. So if we're talking about an alley is a as a way of, of creating a structure within a garden, but it's also a way of providing a, a, a mechanism of of, of uh, perambulating through it. But it also defines views, and you know you can use an alley to create a vista, and a vista is basically a, a framed view. So this is exactly what we've got in 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 the case in 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 what you call the the vista. You are using that alley which has the trees on either side to create a vista, which focuses the view on a particular uh, object. And in this case, I think it's the, the twin pillars at the bottom, which then become the focal point. And then when you go beyond that, you've got the borrowed landscape again out over the Hudson. So you've got all these elements, cover, all these design elements and features coming into this one spectacular feature within the garden. It is probably our most spectacular single feature in the garden for sure. Um, so when we get down to the very bottom of the vista, what we call the Vista Overlook and look down toward the gatehouse, which you can see on the map here. This is how we found it 10 years ago, completely overgrown, no gates on the old gate pillars. We were able to, with the help of a local Boy Scout troop, sort of excavate and, and remove all the vegetation that was going on the gatehouse. We thought we might want to garden inside the gatehouse and turn it into maybe a folly or hortus conclusus, as you'll help us think about here in a minute. We got in there and the soil was so bad and so full of litter that we excavated everything and ended up with this, what I think is a very lovely planting and what might be a controversial idea to leave the old graffiti there, but I think it really contributes to the idea of a folly and you can just see how some of the plants juxtaposed against the, the remnants of that old graffiti really do give it something that's quite unique um, in gardening and certainly at Untermeyer. And maybe that is the idea of a folly in general, Toby? I mean, a folly is, is literally, as the word says, it's, it's a piece of fun, a bit of silly, silly nonsense uh, in the garden if you can afford it. I mean, again, it's a very sort of popular thing in, in 18th, 19th century landscapes. And um, the one on the left hand side is, is this huge, great um, pineapple structure, which is in a wall, set into a wall garden. Uh, in Scotland, you can actually go stay in the in the pineapple. But again, that was showing off because pineapples were the the most tricksy plant to grow. Uh, and if you could grow pineapples, you had a really good gardener, and uh, that showed the quality of your establishment. So I think you know I think folly. Again, it's quite a bit of fun. I mean, there's one from Central Park there, top left, and the bottom right one is uh, Chanticleer uh, down at uh, uh, in Pennsylvania. Um, but I think, I mean, I, I, I was also thinking when I looked at those pictures uh, when we were putting this together, and I was really, I really like that idea where you've left the graffiti on the wall, and it kind of, you know, if that was an urban landscape, I'd say that was that was guerrilla gardening. It was taking a, a disused piece of land that no one had any use for and beautifying it and and making it nice for for people within that environment. So, you know, it's it's not guerrilla gardening per se because it's not in an urban environment, if you like. Um, but I think, I think leaving the, the graffiti on the wall was a, was a piece of genius. Um, in terms of quarters conclusus, uh, that again is, we talked way, way, way back when we said about the, the gardens at um, the Cloister Museum in New York, and that idea of, of monastic establishments, they also had things called quarters conclusus, not everyone did, but some of them did. And it was a closed private garden that was dedicated to the Virgin Mary, and we can go into the symbolism later if anybody has any questions. 
But that idea of a horse conclusive uh, closed space became a very popular thing in, in Renaissance gardens, um, which were often big and bold and, and, and outward looking. But that idea of having a small quiet space where you could go into and kind of shut yourself away from the rest of the world um, became quite popular. It didn't have to be um, totally walled in. You could have a space where you had a view out and that was often times uh, also a very popular but I think, again, that's such a, a contemporary idea that we use the garden as an escape from our everyday lives, uh, a place to, to, to revivify, a place to sort of charge our batteries, if you like. And, you know, I think especially so in, in lockdown times now, um, particularly in Europe and, and this whole sort of our worlds have become much smaller because we can't travel. But to have that garden space where you can go and just be outside and it doesn't have to be huge, that sort of private a uh, place to think and contemplate and to reflect is, is I think, even more important than ever right now. No, it certainly has the same parameters of our grand walled garden, but a completely different feel for sure. Um, so it's, here's an overhead view of it, and it even serves as sort of a courtyard garden as well. Yeah, I mean, I like that. I mean, I think the garden is, is that's so cool to actually have the garden inside the house. I mean, it, it really is a folly that, you know, it was, was a house and is now a garden. But that idea of, of, of a courtyard, yeah, it's just an enclosed space. Uh, but to create you know, courtyard gardens, I think is, is again, it's, it's such a nice idea where people um, transform a space that could possibly otherwise be quite uninteresting. Uh, if it's part of architecture, but to then liven it up with plants. I mean, it, again, the idea, sorry, goes back to Roman gardens and that idea of a, a peristyle courtyard created within the, the architecture of the domus or the, or the villa. Um, Islamic gardens, again, we've talked about, but oftentimes in a smaller space, there will be an architectural courtyard within the building, uh, which would then try and be transformed into a garden space. So if one's lucky enough to have a courtyard or to create a courtyard, it's something that offers that space where one could be private, but inspired. No, I, I, I love the sound of that. And again, that's certainly how I think that the old ruin garden ends up getting used most often, completing a, a completely different point of view from the walled garden. Um, I'd like to walk back up the hill from the gatehouse to the rock garden, what we call the rock and stream garden. Um, I think that defining a rock garden starts to limit your palette of plants to choose from. So we've tried to open that up a little bit. Here you can see historic images of the rock garden at its prime that may be Mr. Untermeyer walking down that path um, that we see. And this is largely how we found that space when we arrived 10 years ago. In fact, it, it took months for me to be able to find this space. I knew it existed. I'd seen some drawings and photographs. I could not find it on the grounds anywhere, um, but we started poking around. We knew that there was this old dry laid stone wall with some formal benches in front of it and a garden gnome. And after digging around through one winter, we were actually able to unearth this entire area that was completely silted in and discovered some remnants of that old bench. We then figured, decided we, we could and should do something to restore this garden. We hired uh, Glen Carr Water Gardens to come in and help us reconstruct and redesign the garden. And now it really does serve as a planting garden. And so we call it rock and stream, but, but sometimes rock gardens are, are hard to define, Toby. I think of them as almost anything that has a rock in it and then you can plant around that. But, but what do you think as far as the definition of a rock garden? It's, it's uh, a, a broad feast, if you like. There's so many yeah. different definitions to a rock garden. Um, and again, depending on whether you're a purist uh, and think that the, the rock should be laid out exactly as a sort of geological outcropping, even though it's false, some people back in history would say that you wanted to create the most bizarre looking uh, pile of rocks that would be an artistic feature, but uh, clearly not an imitation nature. Some people even went to the extent of creating miniature alpine landscapes. There's a garden in Henley in, in Britain called Friar Park, uh, which is owned, uh, was owned by, or still owned by the family, but George Harrison uh, uh, lived there. And the garden there has, the rock garden there has a, has a model of the Matterhorn mountain in it. 
So I, I think, you know, your definition is as good as any that, you know, a rock garden is a garden that has rocks in it, whether they're artistically arranged, whether they're an imitation of geological strata. And sometimes you can also have rock gardens that are not necessarily planted. Um, you think of the Japanese, uh, what we call the Zen gardens, that's a rock garden, but it's it may have a little bit of moss in it, but it's certainly not a planted garden. So very, very many definitions of, of, of rock gardens. And we can talk about what the definition between a rock garden and an alpine garden is in. Right, so my I think to, in my mind, when I say rock garden, I most immediately think of an alpine garden which while we try to employ a portion of this particular landscape with some alpine plants um, or alpine acting plants that, that we didn't want to be relegated to just planting alpine plants. Um, so with the, the ground cover <clears throat> and low growing alpine like plants is what we came up with here as part of our rock and our stream garden. Absolutely, I think when you're talking about a rock garden you can be a little bit more, uh, shall we say, broad brushstrokes with your planting. It's one of those things that it's it's in a rock arrangement, um, and therefore you can put the plants in that not necessarily are, are, are you know botanically alpines. This sort of alpine garden became really popular in the sort of late 19th, 30, 20th centuries uh, in Britain, when a lot of the plant hunters were exploring. Western China and coming across a huge range of very beautiful and unusual alpine plants up on the scree slopes in, in, in Yunnan province and Sichuan province in particular. So I think the difference is, is that an alpine garden is particularly constructed both in terms of the rock arrangements and the soil type to grow alpine plants and obviously there's a whole range of different alpine plants so you have to to choose your soils or, or develop your soils and develop your aspects and what have you so an alpine garden is really quite a specialist feature and it's it's, it's primarily there to grow alpine plants whereas a rockery is perhaps or a rock garden is perhaps more an ornamental feature which gives you broader scope to to interpret the planting the uh, in a more artistic way if you like and I think that's the direction we headed in. And you can see here um, the upper portion of the Rock and Stream Garden. We certainly went a bit more informal um, with plants that didn't require the exact same soil conditions as you would have to find in an alpine garden. Um, the plant group and Ira Feinberg were generous enough to donate these plants to us this spring. And we were able to get them in and lay them out. And within one year, we started to see something of a garden happen here. But it certainly is in more of an informal style. And here you can see as the Rock and Stream Garden ends, it, it melds with our Temple of Love. And I just love this overhead shot of our Temple of Love that really does show the shapes and forms of beds and architecture in a very informal style, I believe. One of the things that really impresses me about the, the garden uh, is the way that you've got this, this formality and informality juxtaposed and there's no sort of jarring connections. It's, you know, each area has its own uh, compartment and again the topography I guess uh, uh, helps that you've got this, this ch changes in level that you can meld your way through the, the, the garden. And I think you're right, I mean the rock garden is, is I wouldn't say it's an imitation of nature but it, it's, it's clearly uh, a form of, of natural uh, influence and the, the influence we talked about right at the start was formal and we said that was all very very straight lines and geometry and axes and, and angles and what have you. Uh, informal is exactly the opposite, it's very much that idea of using sinuous curvaceous forms. Uh, I think it was William Kent, uh, no it was, I forget exactly who it was, it might have been more Horace Walpole, uh, said nature abhors a, a straight line, Alexander Pope. So, Nature imitation, you don't, you, nature never has straight lines uh, in it. So that idea of using a, a curvaceous forms uh, just to sort of give a sense of, of, of informality is, is beautifully picked out. And again, that drone shot just is, is just lovely. It's, it's almost a sort of piece of sculpture from above. No, it, 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 it was really inspirational and it gives a nice view of what we're doing. So this is just off the side of that drone shot. And I think when we're talking about an informal planting, we almost have to talk about mixed plantings and naturalistic plantings and this is at the very bottom of the stream as it comes down and meets the temple of love and we planted a mixed planting 
here and if I'll advance just a little bit and our naturalistic planting looking toward the cascade beds which we'll look at here in a moment and just help me think about the difference between a mixed planting and a naturalistic planting Toby. I don't think there's really very much difference. Uh, it's more about the palette of plants and how you arrange them. So a mixed planting, in my definition, would be where you're using different types of, 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 of plants. So you're using a mixture of shrubs, small trees uh, to give you a structure. You supplement that with, with perennials and um, bulbs and tender bedding plants slotted in as and when you so you so feel like you should want to do that and the idea is that hopefully you can get a, 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 a level of interest that goes pretty much all year round. Uh, it came out of the shrubbery in the 19th century, the Victorians had this great idea of shrubberies that you sort of think of Monty Python um, and that idea of, of having this sort of collection of shrubs which kind of looks all right maybe for one month of the year, particularly if they're rhododendrons, and, but the rest yeah. of the year it's this gloomy dark green thing, particularly if you're using evergreens, or even worse if you're using mixture of evergreens and, and I don't know, purple foliage or you know, variegated, what have you. So the idea was to sort of try and mix that with, with, with all the other types of plants that are out there, so you can start to get a, an idea of, of a, a progression of planting interest through the seasons. Uh, so that's really what mixed planting is. Um, it's often done in a naturalistic way. And I think what you say with naturalistic planting is exactly the opposite of your tulip garden. You're not serried ranks of, of tulips all the same color or beds of this, that and the other. The idea is just to have this sort of soft um, approach where in many ways you're, you're allowing the plant to be center stage. You're looking at the plants, you're giving them the space to display their beauties and you can enjoy the shape of, of the cornice mass or you could look at the, the, the light of the fritillaries coming up through the unfurling fern fronds and what have you. So it's, it's very much more about the plants themselves uh, and allowing them to display their beauties and then perhaps marshalling them into great mass plantings. And I think no, it's, it's that certainly is the, the approach I enjoy the the best is is to really let the plant show off. And I, I know at Untermeyer we're a public garden open 365 days a year. So to to let to, to display beds and plants in a combination that carries interest through all 365 days is very important. I think also I mean the other advantages from my perspective, uh, you know, personally is that um, secondly it requires less maintenance. And thirdly, there's, there's, there's not much of a jump between naturalistic planting and wildlife friendly planting. I mean, the two can be very, very much drawn together. So you can get a beautiful display of planting, but at the same time, you're helping um, the wildlife and biodiversity within the garden. Mm, sure. So, so next to this informal garden of the Rock and Stream Garden, in fact, they're a bit contiguous, is our Temple of Love. Um, and like you mentioned, this juxtaposition of formal and informal. The Temple of Love originally had this formal, and I'm going to say that's a Greek temple, Toby, that sat on top of it. And while Untermeyer was still alive, it transformed to this more pavilion looking temple or gazebo type temple, again, with this very beautiful view out over the river and the New Jersey Palisades. And, and we have this amazing shot that happened with visitors in our garden. And so opposed to the formal style that we saw in the walled garden, um, I think this really exemplifies the romantic style of gardening. Yeah, I think romantic, again, a romantic, what is a romantic garden is, is, is you know, garden history-wise is quite a difficult answer. There's, it means a lot of different things to different people. But I like the idea of, of, of creating a space that uh, is romantic, a place you want to be in, a place you want to sit down and, and, and be in that special place with a special person. And, that idea again of senses, uh, of, of, of using a garden and a design to appeal to the senses, whether it's uh, a sense of, of beauty through the landscape in terms of the elements, whether it's that noise of a beautiful water feature, the sense of smell, just, just, just creating that sort of sense of romance is again something that gardens, are, it's really important for gardens that you can use these spaces as a whole, uh, a garden as a space for a whole range of different uh, opportunities and one of those is is love and romance and again it goes right back to the medieval times when the the, the whole idea of the of the herber garden the little castle garden was as a place to sort of 
indulge in courtly love and chivalrous knights uh, chatting up the damsels in distress and, and using uh, uh, that as a space for, for romance. I think that's delightful. I think it's a, it's a lovely thing to use a garden for. No, oh, wonderful. I, I certainly agree. So this, this temple of love, um, and we've talked about temple, but on top of it, it has this gazebo or this pavilion. Um, it was in quite bad shape when we were there 10 years ago. This entire restoration was allowed by a very generous donation from former Yonkers mayor, Martin Nelly, um, who dedicated it to his wife and his children. Um, we wouldn't have this garden without his support. And here you can see a bit more contemporary shot that starts to look like Untermeyer's original plantings as well. But just quickly looking at pavilion and gazebo as elements in the garden. Uh, there's so many different types of garden building and they all fall into different categories. So temple, rotunda, pavilion, gazebo. You, you've you got to draw the line somewhere. Gazebo literally means a place where you look out from and goes back to Italian Renaissance ideas that you had a walled in garden. If you wanted to see over the top, you had to have a building in which to do it. And it also is a feature of architecture of the time as well. So it's something that's historical. It can be made contemporary in all sorts of ways. You could make a summer house a gazebo. It's somehow you've got to draw some definitions. But that idea of having buildings in the gardens is 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 a lovely one. Whether it's a, a an open one like this, whether it's like that, and you grow climbers over it. Whether it's a, a garden shed where you want to hide yourself away from everybody for a while. Whether it's somewhere where you have friends over for a cup of tea. That idea of having a, a building in the garden that you can you can use and increase the use space of a of a garden. So buildings and gardens are still hugely um, varied and hugely practical, I think. And, you know, the definition, uh, you've got to draw well, the line. Warren, so. I'm sorry, go ahead. No, sorry. No, from what I understand, it was uh, Mr. Untermeyer's favorite place to take a nap was at the temple, here at the Temple of Love. Um, and what he had to look down on were um, what you define in your book as a cascade, and ironically, that's how we've described these beds as our cascade beds since we installed them um, during the during that this garden's restoration. So here we can see what it looked like in Untermeyer's time, um, a very informal and I would say quite romantic looking landscape spilling down from this giant rock structure, this romantic rock structure. This is how we found it 10 years ago. I wasn't even sure that there were cascades <laughs> attached to this garden anymore. Um, we're looking at the the big catch basin for the waterfalls that come off the 30 foot uh, romantic structure that holds the Temple of Love and, and goes through that small bridge and cascades down the water. But we found it overgrown like this and we're able to transform it with some, some liberty that we took with Untermeyer's original proportions to to, to increase the, the size of the water and the scale to match the structure behind it and allow visitors to move through the garden. And we've ended up with these really lovely cascade beds, but it has this waterfall again that we had a lot of help from Glencar Water Gardens put in that dissects these two beds. It ends up in this pool at the bottom of the hill. Um, stepping into that garden and into that cascade, it really does create a moment that is, is strikingly different than anything you can find anywhere else in the garden. Um, but this whole idea of a cascade is, was not unique to Untermeyer by any means, was it? No, and I think one of the, the things I like about cascades is it's one of those features that can be both used in a formal concept and, or a context and an informal one. Uh, the picture on the left here is a lovely garden in Ireland, which is has a lovely microclimate, which allows this great diversity of, of semi-hardy plants. And there's, they're lucky enough to have a river running through it. but they'd adapted that river to put these little mini waterfalls or cascades that just adds a whole new uh, dimension to it. Top right is a, a garden in, in Rome uh, that was actually part of a, a, a big urban renewal project. And the two bottom ones on the right hand side, that's um, Roberto Bell Marx and a very sort of cubist brutalist uh, garden in Brazil. And the one left to that is uh, an Islamic garden in Iran. And we talked about Islamic gardens earlier on, and they had some beautiful ways of taking water from one level to another in a formal setting. So you can put a, a, a level of um, like a slope at 45 degrees and put fish scales patterns on it, a bit like the, the pattern between the 
uh, the loggia and the the walk down to the to the view the vista and you yep. can just water just jumps as it goes down the, the cascade and another one they had was where you'd actually make holes behind the cascade and put a little tea light behind it so it would light up at night so cascades are a, a wonderful way of taking water from one level to another within a garden whilst providing a sense of of unity and connection and um the, the informal one here is, is just lovely and it's a beautiful restoration no absolutely so stepping back up to the top of the cascades and, and this picture doesn't do our waterfall justice there's what we often call a grotto but you can't experience it you can't get inside of it and there's waterfall coming down the sides and over the big cantilevered ledge but we'll, we've often called this a grotto and it certainly is a waterfall but maybe you can help us figure out exactly what if those two items can even be related the grotto and the waterfall oftentimes they were i i would say that a waterfall is is a cascade but just much with a with a much taller fall or a higher fall uh that's a, that's as simple as the definition between those two is so a cascade is a is a is a low fall and a waterfall is a high fall in terms of of grottos that's um again it's sorry it's something that goes back to roman times that idea of these the nymphs in their grottos and that sort of sacro-religious element of wild nature and roman gardens bigger ones did create these sort of false caves and put their nymphs and, and streams and uh, springs in them and became another a revival idea in the renaissance gardens of, of italy in the 16th century particularly so um, i think oftentimes it was a way of trying to imitate nature while creating something artistic so what the renaissance garden came up with this idea of the third nature it's neither art it's neither nature but it's an interesting combination of two which i think is a pretty good description of gardens full stop but also if you think of a hot climate it's quite a nice place to go hang out if it's if it gets too warm outside you can retreat to your grotto it's cool it's shady you might have some lovely green ferns and as in this case you have some jets of water to 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 cool the air although this i think actually is a as in a, a garden in germany so it's one of those features that's kind of gone out of fashion, although there's been rather fun ideas recently and people have been creating grottos. There's one in Scotland, uh, which is more a piece of art, I guess, but the whole grotto is, is underground and you go in and the whole thing is lined with amethyst. So it's purple throughout, quite a, an eye-catching event. But again, it's something that I think uh, could be brought back into, into fashion, I think. I think the grotto needs to come back. I, I would not argue that um and so just to wrap up our tour of the elements we've actually restored at untermeyer before we think about some of the elements that we want to get to and looking for your help with those um i'd like to look at the last element to talk about and this is still at the temple of love it sort of relates to what we were speaking about um in an etc or in small spaces of the garden in a courtyard or hortus conclusus where you can sit and enjoy the garden and be a bit protected and isolated and this is untermeyer's version um maybe not quite a bower at the bottom of the temple of love in the cascades but how we have reconstructed it and certainly starts to act a bit more like a bower. Granted, it is, we, we built the, the frame and the bench and are encouraging plants, and we're still just starting with that for plants to grow over and around it and turn it a bit more green than it is. But you have some really great examples of bowers being made with live plants. Yeah, the bower is another of those features that owes its origins to the medieval garden. We were talking about that idea of romance, a little place you want to hide away with your loved one. And what nicer way to do that than be secluded by uh, a canopy of beautifully scented plants. So the idea of a, of a bower was originally either with a wooden structure with climbers growing over it, or of actually weaving together plants to create a living bower, which had obviously changed with the seasons. And it's something that's again such a, an idea that can be brought up to date but kind of not used as much as it should be and not only is it a nice place to sit you can be sitting there on your own reading a book or enjoying the smell of the roses or the sunset view or you know having a nice glass of wine with whomever but it's a really easy feature to make uh, even in the smallest garden for example that top right hand picture there is just a it's a, a little seat 
underneath some peepholes uh, for growing up sweet peas or, or real peas in a, in a little vegetable garden. So all you need really is a few sticks and a, and a bag of nasturtium seeds and you've got yourself a bower. So go to another extent and you can actually start to weave little willow, uh, willow, fra willow wands and actually create a living sculpture bower. But it's one of those features that underused and should also have a, 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 a revivification. Well, we're, we're trying to do our part. I can't disagree with that. So Toby, that takes us halfway through to um, where we'll start talking about future restoration elements in the same way. We'll take another walk around the garden. I think I could use about 10 minutes of break if we could all meet back here, say at 325, and we'll look at the second half of the elements from your book.
So I'd like to welcome everyone back to the second half of our conversation with noted garden author, scholar, historian, and designer Toby Musgrave. Again, I'm Timothy Tillman. I'm the head gardener at Untermeyer Gardens. We've just spent a bit of time walking through the gardens and the things that the Untermeyer Garden Conservancy has accomplished with the restoration of the space in the past 10 years. And now I'd like to take the next few moments to go through future restorations. We're going to look at elements that Untermeyer had created and left behind that we are looking to restore over the next few years. And then at the end, I'd like to look at a few elements that we'd like to create originally throughout the garden. Um, so stepping into that, um, we'll go back into the walled garden and for a moment and look at an element that's next to the temple. And that would be the old swimming pool. This uh, pool was designed and built by Bosworth and Untermeyer when Untermeyer was in the gardens. Um, it then fell into disrepair after Untermeyer's death. I think it was used as a compost dump. Um, you can see rubble and leaves from years of accumulation in that same pool. There was a restoration effort in the 70s where the pool was dug out by volunteers and then re, <clears throat> um, completely refurbished and restored and was an active swimming pool again through the 70s. When we arrived in 2011 as the Garden Conservancy, this is how we found that pool once again completely deteriorated. So it was a swimming pool. We think we're gonna turn it back into a pool and we'll talk about that here in a second. But Toby, the, the purpose of pools in a garden. Maybe we can start with that. Yeah, we've been talking a lot about the different types of water features, whether it's a real, a canal, a water garden, a water feature, and pools come into a sort of somewhere between a, a canal and a real uh, in terms of size. But I, I, in the book, I decided that we needed a definition between a pond and a pool. So for my definition, a pool is something that has a geometric shape to it. Uh, so whether it's it's whether it's long and narrow or wider than a rill, whether it's circular, whether it's square, I decided that a pool was something that had a geometric form to it. And as we said before, it's something that you can use as a reflective space. It could be something that's in combination with a fountain or a bubbler or another form of water feature that always adds that dimension. In this case, you can see something that's uh, a reflecting pool in a rose garden. We have a, a, an eye catcher in another garden, a circular feature, which actually has a fountain in it, which also reflects in, in a still. Bottom left-hand side is a much more contemporary garden using quite exotic planting in there, We're, or using the, the pool uh, as, as a place in which to grow sort of quite exotic uh, aquatics as well. So it doesn't have to have the water uh, visible, but a pool is, is formal, uh, straight lines, pond is informal, curvy lines. So I, I do have a question, and I'm going to take the liberty to back up in the slide a bit, is this pool that Untermeyer had designed has um, what our president Steve Burns noticed, a ziggurat shape. He's our architect. And thinking about that and thinking that's uniquely Persian. So we are calling this our Persian pool inside our Indo-Persian walled garden. Um, does that jive with what you're thinking, Toby? I think it's an interesting concept, and I think it's always nice to have ways of identifying uh, places uh, in a garden. Uh, I worked a few years back on a restoration project in, in, in Britain on a garden, and again, it was something that was very, uh, something that visitors very much appreciated was if you started to give an area of a garden a name, it may not have been an original name of, of the garden when the garden was there, but it was something that you're almost bringing the garden back to life. You're restoring the garden, you're bringing it uh, a whole new dimension to it. So it's nice to give features within a garden uh, an identity, if you like, and why not? I think it's an interesting ziggurat shape. I mean, the, the, I love the idea that the, the, the garden's called a Greek garden and the Greeks never really made gardens, but you know, <laughs> there we go. I, I think that was a reference to all the architecture, but but yes, it was confusing and overwhelming at, at first for sure. So so thank you for answering that question. And in fact, folks, if anybody has questions for myself or especially Toby, um, if you submit those in the questions um, in your interface with the meeting, 
we'll try to get to a few of those at the end of the presentation. But stepping down and looking closer at this pool, um, I hope everybody can see that it's an old mosaic pool, which makes it even more fascinating than just the ziggurat shape and where it's located next to the temple. And we're currently in the process, we've just finished the construction drawings for the restoration of this mosaic. And so we were gonna take it out of a swimming pool realm. We're gonna raise the bottom up to 18 inches and make it truly more of a reflecting pool. So it should fit our parameters there. You can see the mosaic at the bottom of this pool was populated with all these different sea creatures um, when it was in good shape. During the 70s restoration, interestingly, one of the apprentices that was working on this particular project in the 70s is now the owner of the mosaic studio that is currently doing the design for our restoration that we hope to have done by 2023, 2024, 2023. Um, and, but mosaic is really widespread throughout this garden. It's in the amphitheater, it's in our loggias, um, but Again, mosaic is not a concept, a garden concept that's unique to, to Untermeyer, is it, Toby? Not at all. And I think the, the patterns that you have there I, really reminds me of some Roman mosaics I've seen in gardens of, of Pompeii and what have you. So yet another classical element into the, into the mix. But I think it's one of those things that mosaics is something that's kind of underused in um, gardens as as Sometimes it's used kind of overkill. Uh, there's a couple of pictures here where the garden is nothing but mosaic, um, where it can go a little bit too much, too far. But it's a beautiful way of doing a, a, an alternative surfacing, a horizontal surfacing, whether you're using you know, the tesserae, the little uh, square stones, or whether you're going to decide to use pebbles uh, in perhaps a more sort of Chinese-inspired way. But it's one of those things that is quite expensive to do. Uh, you need a really good artisan to, to do it, but the effects are, are stunning. But having said that, one of the other things you can do is just have a bit of fun. You can just get, get yourself a bag of grout or, or of, of, of adhesive, get a few old pots and a few broken up old teacups and mirrors and what have you, and you can sort of make your own pastiche of, of this, that and the other with, with different bits stuck together, which is a, a way of expressing your individuality. And I think, you know, one of the things I've said all along is, is, is the gardens for individuals. I think that idea that, you know, you can go into a garden and just express your creativity. I mean, in this case, Untermeyer had pots of cash with which he could just go and, and play around and, and created this very eclectic and very fun garden. But we can all do that in our own space. Yeah, I, I think so. I, I think gardens with personality are the most interesting gardens. Um, I'd rather sit down and and drink coffee with a gardener that has uh, a lawn full of pink flamingos and garden gnomes as opposed to a perfectly manicured foundation planting. So, so and, and I must confess, I have buckets of material that I wanted to make mosaic from, and it, it's been decades now that I've had these buckets. I, I need to actually get started on something. So stepping away from the formality of the walled garden, again, I'd like to go all the way back down the hill to the bottom of the vista to what we are calling our ornamental vegetable garden. And there's quite an interesting story of this garden. Originally in Untermeyer's time, it was a bit of a transition garden to move from the vista stairs to his Italian vegetable garden that set off to the north quite a bit. So it was a, it was a garden hallway to get from one major element to another. And this is how we found it when we arrived 10 years ago, completely overgrown. There's our Artemisia in full force and the old rose arbor, which is just barely visible um, in the overgrown weeds. We were able to clean it up and start to decipher what we might be able to do with this space. Um, that Italianate vegetable garden now sits underneath a nursing home on part of the property that was sold off that is no longer part of Untermeyer's Gardens. So our first idea is that we would do a vegetable garden in this space to honor the grand vegetable garden that Untermeyer had once had. Um, we've already started working on this, getting local community involvement and interns. And you can see the nursing home in the background of this slide and, and the hedge we've already planted very early trying to cover that up. But we were able to discover the original edging from Untermeyer's shapes in that Rose and Dahlia garden and we excavated a bit and played around with magnets and shovels 
and started to see these shapes and then reinterpreted them for what will be our future ornamental vegetable garden. We just finished this project this summer. We'll plant the cover crop through next summer and actually turn it into an ornamental vegetable garden in a, a year from now. We'll start planting that with spring crops. But I was always a bit confused. Untermeyer had planted his vegetable garden or his kitchen garden on the rem most remote from the house area of the property. Um, so the house was at one corner, the vegetable garden was at the other, and that didn't make a lot of sense to me. But Toby, you, know, you and I were discussing and said that wasn't uncommon at all with kitchen gardens. Not at all. I think it was more, certainly in, in the landscape in the 18th century, it was more the norm. Particularly if you had a capability brand landscape where what you wanted to see was an interpretation of nature that looked more natural than nature. You didn't want a dirty great wall kitchen garden obscuring your view. So in certain of his designs, the kitchen gardens were you know, up to a couple of miles away from the uh, from the kitchens, which must have made a hard work for the for the vegetable gardeners or the gardeners to take all the produce up to the house. And one of the other reasons why vegetable gardens tended to be put at a little, at least a distance from the house was, if you remember back into um, the good old days, the way that you fertilized or kept the soil nurtured was to use various types of manure and of course hotbeds and heating for greenhouses before we had steam and, and, and hot water boilers was to use uh, hotbeds which was also made from manure. So the kitchen garden could be a pretty pongy place um, so you certainly didn't want to have the stink of manure coming through your windows while you were entertaining the great and the good to afternoon tea. So that's one of the reasons why vegetable gardens were put at a distance. That having been said, the vegetable garden was always on the tour. If you had visitors coming, you would take them to the vegetable garden because it was a way of showing off. Again, you'd have the, the latest greenhouses against the wall. You'd have the latest cultivars that are growing in the vegetable gardens. You'd have be able to show the vines that were producing grapes out of season because you had a great head gardener. So. It was an area of prestige and of course the country house vegetable garden was also providing the townhouse when people were in residence then. So it was a really, it was the powerhouse of, of, of the garden if you like. Interesting, I think the fact that we're going to have this on public display, there's definitely a correlation there. Um, and then an element that's often found with kitchen gardens, um, especially those that are ornamental, which is what we're trying to do, is the, the design element of a potager. I, I think this is one of France's greatest contributions to, to world garden art. I mean, you could say the Baroque garden was, but again, that's kind of evolved out of Italy. And yes, from an ornamental perspective, uh, perhaps the Baroque garden is, is the biggest contribution. But I just love the idea of potagers, that this idea of creating a vegetable garden, which is a beautiful ornamental space in its own right. This is Villandre, perhaps the best restored example. Um, but one of the problems is when you, this is, looks picture perfect now, but when you start to harvest vegetables, you get holes where you've taken the produce out, but that's the price you have to pay. But I love that idea of being able to mix the practical with the, with the aesthetically beautiful. Um, and that whole idea of, of geometric shapes with the arrays of, of rows of vegetables. And again, people are doing it with ideas of much more informal way of, of doing it as well. So it's it's a, it's a type of vegetable gardening that can be really played with and also works really well uh, in a small space. No, we're very much looking forward to, to, to planting this garden and, and using a lot of local youth to help us with this and maybe even help with some food scarcity issues in and around Yonkers. So, and create an amazing garden space that was inspired by what Untermeyer left us as well. Um, just next to that space, which was still part of the Rose and Dahlia garden, um, I love this slide is that the snowfall was just right and the temperature was just right, that the old Untermeyer edging that we had not discovered yet melted the snow and showed us these shapes. So thinking of, of potager and parterres, um, our president Steve Burns and I were kind of going back and forth about what kind of style we wanted to plant down in this vegetable garden. And I was leaning away from anything formal or geometric and, <laughs> and this snow fell and these lines were shown to us and I, I immediately lost that argument and we, we were going to recreate these, these geometric shapes that Untermeyer had already installed there. But we're, we've, below this 
vegetable garden, we were thinking we were going to do an orchard in this space. And, and here we have local interns that were helping us dig out that edging and discover that space after we saw that those snowfall shapes. Um, and this is what that garden looks like now. And those are Untermeyer's exact lines and his exact path. In fact, 80% of the edging there is what Untermeyer had left us. And if you look closely, you can see the stakes are in the ground for what are our proposed orchard tree planting. But Toby, you brought up a really interesting idea and it was a concept that I've never even heard of before in gardening. And when you saw this slide, you thought it was obviously a, a gazon coupe. Yeah, it's one of those ideas that also came out of France, out of the Baroque gardens. I'm just going back to what we are saying. I think one of the, the lovely things about restoring a garden is you never quite know where you're going to find the next piece of evidence. Uh, oftentimes there's big gaps in one's knowledge, but to then have a have a nature moment like that where nature is, uh, reveals what you have is, is, is so nice that, you know, you didn't know it was there and you find quite something new. Uh, it's a bit like detective work, I think, restoring gardens. But yes, the, the Gazon Coupe was a, a French idea. We talk uh, about the Baroque gardens and with those great big parterre de broderie, literally embroidery on the ground with these sort of curly whirly box edge beds with, with gravels or, or plants within them and, and hugely high maintenance and hugely sort of ornate and not particularly um, relevant to today unless you're doing a garden restoration. But they also came up with this idea called the Gazon Coupe. Uh, there's a great example at Versailles. If you look, if you're at Versailles and you're looking down over the Orangerie Garden, that's laid out as a Gazon Coupe. And it's it's often also called the sort of parterre d'anglais, the English parterre, because British, of course, were obsessed with lawns. The idea is that you take a lawn and you cut geometric shapes into it and fill those shapes with with gravels or sand or what have you. So the idea is that it's looked down on from above and you see this pattern of, of geometry, um, both the green of the grass and the, 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 the aggregate that you fill in the spaces with. Once again, it's such a, a really easy, cheap way of creating a rather ornate space, drawing your inspiration from history. And you know, when I saw that picture that you showed me, it's like, well, okay, that's another idea that was, was brought to the garden from abroad, but used in a lovely way. And I love the idea that you're then gonna plant uh, um, fruit trees in that space and, and give it another dimension of height as well. And yeah, to, to create the orchard in and of itself is, is going to be interesting, but to, to find those paths and maintain those paths, which won't necessarily be the primary element in the garden, um, but to combine the orchard and the Gazon Coupe, it makes me even more excited about that space now. And speaking about exciting spaces, um, to look at the color gardens and you can see on the map this was a series of originally six color gardens that were on terraces parallel to the vista and actually you could walk in and out of the vista into these separate color gardens um, they were all a bit monochromatic and you can see Untermeyer's staff at the very bottom most color garden in this photo. Um, you can see one of what Untermar had 60 greenhouses through the property. You can see that in the background of this photo. But this was in a fountain that was just at the very base of the lowermost color garden. And again, this is how we found that fountain 10 years ago. We've been, managed to be able to clean it up quite a bit and start to think about how to reuse this space. And if you can bear with me, I have a little video I think that can show some of the this space a bit better than we can with still shots. So I made my way over to the color gardens. There were a series of five color gardens, Toby monochromatic perhaps. Um, so this is the lowermost color garden. You can see the old fountain basin and the stairs I'm on. As the gardens went proceeded up the hillside, there were similar stairs and more dramatic fountains the whole way up. We're hoping we can get some of this land back on park grounds and do some restoration of those as well. At the moment, there's a parking lot for our neighboring hospital. There's debris and riprap from parking lot construction. Um, we have old greenhouse foundation as we go up as well. So in fact, let's go take a look at one or two of those things. So I've made it up to the second color garden and you can see all this construction debris, including an old arbor that used to decorate Untermeyer's gardens. And looking up to color garden number three, you can see that's now a parking lot, not exactly horticulturally sophisticated. So I've moved up to color garden number four, 
which you can see the similar stairs going up to color garden number five. And I love how there's this pair of U's that you can imagine were a formal clipped hedge in Untermeyer's time. So on the far side of color garden number four, which is still rather complete, except it's surrounded by parking lot on all three sides, um, we do find this arch, which is a really nice feature. And we really hope we can incorporate this into the future color gardens. So I've made my way back up to the fifth and now final color garden. The sixth one is buried underneath the hospital service road forever. But I know I'm standing right on top of a fountain that our president Steve Burns actually dug out. I know he came in one Saturday after studying the drawings and said, give me a shovel. He disappeared into the woods and came back an hour or two later having dug out the rim of the pool that I'm standing on. So we're really excited to put the string of five remaining color gardens together in the future. Or Toby, should I be calling them monochromatic gardens? <laughs> yeah, I think it's um, yeah, it's an interesting concept, the idea of, of monochromatic gardens. We'll come on to that uh, in a sec. Sure. So, so this is the fountain that Steve Burns actually dug out as it was in its day. And I, we're not sure exactly, but obviously there were several fountains included in this Paris's six gardens. Um, each one of these gardens served as a bit of a garden room, I do believe. And if you look into the, the far side of the slide, you can see stairs that were going up to the vista as it descended down toward the river. So that's how these gardens were all strung together and related to, to one another. But they certainly serve as a terrace and the steps and all these other elements we've had through it. So Toby, can you sort of take me through those elements? Yeah, I think that um, terracing is is one of those elements which is is perhaps the most effective way of of, of setting a, a formal garden on a slope site that you need those flat areas uh, to 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 create your garden space, if you like. Uh, and the way that you do that is to obviously create flat levels and then connect those uh, terraces by steps is the most uh, uh, common way or, or ramps as well. It was really a, the whole idea was a one of those ones that came in with the Italian Renaissance, which was a huge step forward in the whole development of architecture and garden. Um, that idea that the garden and the house were a united whole, that the, the setting for the garden was the house and the house was the setting for the garden. So in, as I said, in medieval times, you might have a corner of the castle where you'd shove a little herber and do your romantic stuff. But the Renaissance linked that architecture and garden form together. And today it's still the best way. And I think in this case, that idea where you've got the walk going down, which is more of a slope, and this idea of using the terraces as a connect between them is a really clever one. And the pictures here on the right hand side, the bottom one is a 19th century sort of recreation of an Italian uh, uh, sort of formal garden. The one above that's the sort of arts and crafts one. But the one on the left is actually a garden in, in San Francisco. And I love that way in a, in a hilly city on an urban plot that you can actually use uh, this idea of terraces and steps to create a really interesting garden form in a really small space, which is not only practical to be in, but it also looks nice when you're looking down on it from above. So terracing steps, ramps, yeah, great way of connecting uh, levels, creating uh, flat garden spaces, yeah. And uh, once more, this, the idea of steps is you know, you, you use the type of steps to fit your garden style. So if you've got a formal garden, you create lovely sort of stone steps. Bottom left hand one is a Japanese garden. So you're create, connecting a different areas of moss garden. So you just use you know informal flat stones. I like the one on the top left, which is actually railway sleepers uh, with some rather exotic xeriscape planting. Uh, again, that sort of gravel on the on the on the step just gives that sense of sort of desert feel to it. And the bottom right one again is a very contemporary idea of using core steel as the riser uh, and then a, a, an aggregate as the as the tread so so many different ways you can create uh, steps but i always think with steps you've got to make sure that you can walk on them people always get oftentimes get the space of the riser to to tread ratio wrong and then you're tripping over yourself <laughs> So true. And so the steps that Untermeyer's led to different garden rooms within these color gardens. One of the other ways that we, we talked right at the start about the idea of creating a wall garden, you're creating these defined spaces within a larger space and giving them their own uh, feel, their own style, their own theme, their own uh, atmosphere, if you like. And that's another way that you can do great things on a 
if you've got enough of a, a size of garden, you can start to create different areas with different themes within that garden using garden rooms. And it's it's something that I think the sort of gardens of, of Edwin Lutchins and Gertrude Jekyll, the Arts and Crafts Gardens of a Golden Afternoon, all that sort of Downton Abbey kind of thing, did so perfectly. And again, I think one of the other great things with garden rooms is that you can create a interesting uh, structure with the plant and the way you use whatever division you're using whether it's hedges or walls or trellis or whatever but then the the planting sort of softens that sense of, of straight line geometry or uh, formal shapes but also you can then create rooms that have the different flowering seasons or different uh, times of the year when you flower so if you've got that space you know, one of the things we all struggle with as gardeners is trying to have the garden looking lovely all year round, which is, you know, a fool's quest. But with, if you've got rooms, you can start to do that uh, spring garden, a summer garden, autumn garden, whatever. And again, that sense of dis discovery and surprise as you, as you walk through the garden. I have, I'm a great fan of garden rooms. Yes, and, and your example of garden rooms have some water elements in it, as did Untermeyer's Terrace Color Gardens. And so, so that takes us back to another water element, just maybe moving this time, but but help me think about fountains in a different way. Ah, oh, just fountains. I mean, it's there's, there's as many different types of fountains as there are stars, you know? There's so many ways that people are so inventive with, with fountains, but it, it's also one of those elements that you can use to create or, or introduce and establish a, a theme and, and an atmosphere or a style. I mean, the top left is actually in, in California and it's a perfect example of that sort of Hispanic, Islamic, Spanish uh, revival idea, that eight pointed uh, pool with, with the fountain in it. Yeah, do what you like with fountains. They're so much fun. Um, and I just love that one, which looks like a, a thistle thistle head, which, which just, I don't know, it's just as fun. But water, yeah, water I, is a must. I'm, I'm torn between the, the thistle head and the stack of stones, so. Yeah, it's a beautiful one. Actually, in the, our garden here, we have a, similar to the stack of stones, but it's actually a stainless steel sphere, um, which I, I modified because the fountain comes out the top, so I actually put a light inside the fountain. So at nighttime, it actually looks like the water's on fire. It looks like a flame coming out of the top, and, that's, and it reflects as well. That's kind of fun. Uh, I'm taking notes as you're talking. Thank you. <laughs> So the, the last concept that was in Untermeyer's Color Gardens is, is the idea of planting a monochrome garden. And I know I, I was helping design a garden as an intern at the Scott Arboretum, and they were talking about a white garden. And I, I was getting really confused, and I finally had to, to, to hold my hand up and say, really, all the, all the plants are going to be white, every single thing? And th they told me that that wasn't quite the case. Um, but, but what's your take on a monochrome garden? I think it's actually quite hard to do because um, truly I think the only monochrome garden you could make would be a green one uh, with green foliage and green flowers because I mean the picture on the left hand side there is perhaps the most famous white garden in the world that's uh, Vita Sackville West at Sissinghurst in, in, in England but by her own admission and as I recall I don't think she even called it the white garden but she always said that the most important as important were to the white flowers and the shades and tones of white was the shades and tones of green of the foliage, which was as important a, a, a display item as were the textures and forms of the foliage itself. So I think it's it's one of those things where you can say, yeah, we're just gonna use yellow or we'll use yellow foliage and yellow flowers. And I think really effective. Having said that, for the book, it was really hard to find some images of really effective um, monochrome gardens. And I think this was about as close as we got I mean, obviously, we put Vita Sackville's garden in because Vita Sackville's garden in because it is so iconic. But that idea of, of of using maybe one or two, I mean, monochrome literally means black and white. So that was why the top picture is there because it was silver with with the, the 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 black grass and a bit a bit of green in the background. And the bottom one, predominantly blues. But I kind of, it's, I guess, if you said you were just going to go for foliage. Sorry, if you're just going to go for flower colour, you can probably get away with monochrome, but then you kind of have to forget that there's all the foliage there. So maybe it's one of those things that, you know, unless it's going to be a green garden, you're going to have to say, well, we're going to have some green foliage as well. But it's a nice no, effect I, that I do. It, in your images, in the way you said it, it is a nice effect. I, I agree with you. I think you can 
start to use a color as a theme, but I mean, what color doesn't look good with a nice juxtaposed color, at least a little bit of it. So it's, uh, when I got my question answered at the Scott Arboretum in that design workshop was, yes, it can be the basis for a design theme, but then to play off that color and everything relates back to maybe one color. But it's, other than a green garden, you're right. I don't think there should be such a thing as a completely monochromatic garden or completely monochromatic planting. So stepping on from that unrestored element to another fascinating, a bit more whimsical element that was at Untermeyer's garden is the old sundial garden. And here we have a newspaper clipping from 1937 that was describing Untermeyer's gardens and, and highlighting and holding up the sundial garden as the, the world's largest living sundial. Um, so that was interesting in and of itself, probably not up to the design qualifications or credentials of Wells Bosworth and maybe what Untermeyer had done earlier with the walled garden and the temple of love and the vista, but a, an interesting concept nonetheless. And Toby, you were talking about how a bit of character and whimsy is what makes a garden even richer than it could be otherwise. We see, I believe, maybe one of Untermeyer's gardeners setting his timepiece to the sundial. And this is how it looked in its original form. I don't think we're going to be able to or even desire to recreate it exactly like it was, but I'll take you to the site with another little video and talk about how we might approach it in the future. So here I am standing right in the middle of what in 1937 was considered the world's largest living sundial. Um, you can see that it's here in proximity to the Temple of Love and the Rock and Stream Garden, which is behind me. These are ever increasing gardens and this sundial is sort of in the elbow, a little tight to those elements. So we're hoping to take the same circular element that you can see here. We found some of the old irrigation and edging and recreate that with granite from the original Dancing Maiden sculpture, which is more in proximity where the original house was. And again, because this is a little bit tight to existing gardens, we're hoping to move the sundial a little bit to our north into this open glade that will provide a nice transition away from the two existing gardens. So Toby, that's their sundial garden, and it will be in sort of a sunken area. And so I left your, your sunken garden page up here with it too. I know when we were speaking earlier, in your mind, a sunken garden is a very formal garden, at least has these very dramatic walls and terraces as we've discussed before. But talk to me about sundials in the garden. And, and is Untermeyer's the largest example that you've known of? Hi. I, to be honest, I'm, I've not seen one that that uh, that size um, in terms of a planted one, a living one. Anyway, uh, there's certain uh, places in India. There are some amazing observatories, which I suppose aren't really gardens, but the sundials are, are absolutely vast and they're stone. Um, I think some ways it's kind of it's it's almost an evolution of the. In Britain, we used to have this real fashion for, for, for clocks made of bedding. So they'd actually put a clock with a bedding scheme with a clock on it in public parks, uh, which was telling you the time correctly, but obviously it wasn't a sundial. So maybe it's an evolution of that. Um, but as you said, it's a good bit of whimsy and a good bit of fun. I mean, these days, sundials, they can come in all sorts of shapes and sizes. And, and I like that idea of, of using a sundial as, a, a, as an eye catcher or a feature. It's sort of gives a sense of history and it's also, uh, get it right, it's also quite a practical thing to have in the garden. Um, they have a quite an interesting history. Uh, I don't know why, I've never discovered why, but Henry VIII at Hampton Court Palace, his favorite palace, he had a, a privy garden for to their privy, as in private, not in the other word of the use of the word privy. And within that garden, it, again, it was geometric, it was divided up into square uh, plots. And in the middle of the, each of the square lawns, he had a sundial. So I think he had 16 sundials, almost using them like, like statues. So I'm not quite sure what his obsession with sundials were, but they have always been a, a popular feature. And I guess back in the old days, they were quite useful as a, as a, as a way of keeping time. Nowadays, they're just a, you know, a bit of fun. But there's some really ingenious uh, sculptural forms of, of sundials these days. So, you know, a bit of sculpture in a some a talking point as well if you like and a bit of character sure no it's something we need to examine um 
I don't know if exactly how effective it will be at all times of the day. The the location that Untermar Sundial is in and where we're proposing it is a bit wooded, so, so it's not a full sun garden to begin with. Um, and I think we'd like to keep the scale of what Untermeyer had created, but what materials and how we do that and how it reads and how it gets planted is something that we're going to have a lot of fun trying to figure out as we're moving forward. So that really brings us to the end of elements that Untermeyer left behind, at least any that we're still aware of. So I think most of our archaeology in the garden, which has been vast, it seems like, I feel like half of my job in the past 10 years has just been archaeological as opposed to gardening, um, which has made it a lot of fun. But there are a few elements um, that you've covered in your book that we're curious to install at Untermeyer as brand new creations in areas that were never cultivated in the past, at least to our knowledge. Um, and if we could go through those for just a moment. So the first area we're gonna look at is at the lower switchback. And, and I, I kind of cheated here. There are some architectural elements and garden elements that Untermeyer left behind. I think we're gonna expand on that and play with that a little bit. And to do so, we're going to have to walk down into the woods, and there's at least five or six elements within this one area that need to be discussed and thought about before we start really working down here. And we're going to go to our stumpery correspondent one more time. Um, here I am out in the garden. So here I'm standing in the southwest corner of the garden. I couldn't be farther away from the walled garden anywhere on the property. And what we used to consider the switchback meadow, as the carriage trail makes a switchback through the property here, um, but we're considering it to become a stumpery or a dell, or with Toby's help, maybe a hermitage. Um, let me know what you think. Uh, so we have this big space. There's regular depressions around. Um, it has a nice view of the river um, in my foreground, and we hope we can really make an interesting woodland garden out of this space. Also, there's a couple more elements here I want to show you up close. So in this stumpery, dell, hermitage, switchback meadow, um, we have this sort of mystery of these carved stone stairs that would have gone up to some structure or another. Maybe that's where the hermitage goes. Um, and then behind me, we have the remnants of this old pool fountain. Um, Joki Dakwa, Toby, what do you think? I think you've got a lot of lot of potential to to explore there. I think it's one of the things I would say is I think it's really nice that um, you guys are looking to add to the garden because I always some I always get a little bit worried with garden restorations that it's it's great that gardens are restored, uh, particularly when they've been lost. Uh, that's a huge thing to to bring our cultural heritage back to life. But sometimes I get a little concerned that then what's created becomes sort of preserved in aspic, if you like. And I think gardens mm -hmm. have always been an organic art form. And if you go back through history, you look at, take most gardens, you'll find that they've got layers of history, one on top of the other as owners and have come and gone or stars have changed and people change things and gardens evolved. Of course they did because they're organic anyway. So I, I totally take my hat off to you that uh, you want to add to the garden and to take it forward and add something contemporary to it. I think that's 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 as it should be. Well, thank you for that. And I would say um, when I first got started in this garden, and it is a natural historic landscape garden, and so the State Historic Preservation Office wants to approve everything we do. And I was worried that I was going to have to resign as soon as I started because I was I, I didn't want to get involved with a garden where we were just doing a one-to-one -one restoration of a garden frozen in time, which I think is completely antithetical to gardening. And as it turns out, as I started to learn more about the garden, I'd even we'd even found in Untermeyer's notes that of all the, the art that he was involved with and all the art he collected and thinking about the different mediums, he mentioned gardening as his favorite because it was never static, that it was always in process of creation. And I don't, I haven't met a single designer or a gardener that ever wanted to just stop a garden in any particular moment. So, so luckily we have the freedom to interpret the restoration to some extent and just try to honor Untermeyer's vision. And then here we are trying to move forward with even new creations that I would hope 
and imagine that Untermeyer would be happy with as well. So Jilki Dakwa is sort of a new element to me that we hope to put into this, talking about a new idea. Um, but if you could give me a background on, on playing with water. Yes, another type of water feature. I kind of get obsessed with, with water in gardens. Um, we've talked about all sorts of fountains and pools and, and cascades and, and what have you, and rills and canals. But this is a, a slightly different one. And origins, again, uh, for this are Italian Renaissance. Uh, it means water joke. Uh, joke fountains and that idea that and perhaps it's something that works best in a Mediterranean climate or at least a warm climate where you walk into a space and you put your foot on a on a, on a particular tile that's loose and that just squirt then the fountains come on and you get squirted with water so it's a bit of a surprise a bit of a joke um, these days you can do it with all sorts of different ways you can do stuff where you know you break a, a light beam and it sets it off or if you don't want to soak people with water you can use mist units fog units and just get people covered in a burst of fog or mist so I think it's I love it I just think it's a lovely idea that you know you again a sort of sense of surprise a sense of like shock and and playful and fun and I like those ideas so yeah go for it yeah no if, if you've made it that far into the woods you need to have some fun um, and, and speaking of fun we're thinking about making this a stumpery and here's one of our gardeners Liz Dreven um, moving a stump into place or, or getting ready to move it into place but this whole idea of a stumpery is a really fascinating way to address a woodland shade garden area in my mind, Toby. It's one of those ones that's had a bit of a renaissance recently in the last, I guess, 20 years or so. It was once again a Victorian idea where you, you took, uh, you, when you cut a tree down, you dug the roots out and you turned the, the roots upside down and stuck the remains of the stump into the ground and left the roots sticking up to create this kind of bizarre looking sculpture uh, and then in the gaps between the roots which had soil and you'd plant ferns and what have you uh, there's a famous example at Bidolf Grange in 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 the UK from the Victorian times which is a fantasy garden uh, in its own right uh, Prince Charles created one uh, not so long ago at his his gardens at Highgrove Manor in, in Gloucestershire and there's also been a few created in the Pacific Northwest uh, of which this picture is one and I was just thinking while you were saying about hermitage and stumpery, there's, there is a possibility where you could combine the two. Uh, there was a, a fashion in the 18th century, a thing called a root house, which was literally a, a structure made out of, of sort of rough wood or roots uh, into which some poor hermit would have to then sit and, and be miserable on his own. So you could have a, a, an interesting 21st century take on the stumpery with a with a stumpery approach made leading up to a, a root house made from stumps and mm. um, then you have to employ a hermit. Yeah, we're, we're, we're going to invite you over for a visit during the design phase for sure. Um, all of this, and in, in my mind, we're looking at your ornamental woodland entry in your book. All of these ideas we're talking about sort of fit into that concept, no? Very much so, and that idea of ornamental woodland is one which I think works perfectly in, in, in a modern landscape if you have that kind of space. The idea was really a, a, a 19th century one from Britain, and as I was saying earlier on, there was that idea of you had to see that the garden was a work of art. It had to be clear that the hand of man was visible in the design. And that was always a problem once you got beyond the terrace. So let's say you've got, you beat yourself a nice Italianate house, you put yourself an Italianate terrace down with all your parterres and your bedding, and then the terrace stops. And beyond that, you've got 2000 acres of capability, brand more natural and lands natural landscape, which is also your agricultural land. So how do you make some sort of statement that that's not uh, nature? Well, one of the ways you could do that was to create an ornamental woodland as almost like a buffer zone. Uh, so you take your, your native woodland, you then into, into that you start to plant exotic trees and shrubs that come from abroad and you create something that's very, very beautiful. So it's, it's, it's native woodland augmented, supplemented by introduced species that have an ornamental uh, uh, look to them and rhododendrons were a huge fashion in the later part of the 19th century. So that idea of ornamental woodland, I think, is, is a gorgeous one that's still so contemporary and we have such a range of plants uh, to choose from to do. So that idea of, again, there's a sense of romance about that, a sense of beauty, a sense of the sublime. 
I, I come from the middle of the country and landlocked. And so being under the canopy is where I feel that very sense. And so, yeah, I think that's something we can include down here. Um, not much difference between that and a Dell, or can you define Dell a little bit more clearly for me? I think a Dell, a Dell, a Dell is really basically a depression in the ground, like a mini valley. And how you wish to garden that is is kind of up to you. This is once again a garden in the Pacific Northwest, which you can see there's a sort of formal gateway going into the Dell Dell garden to give it a sense of framing with a bit of a stumpery going on on the right hand side. But once again, I think it's very much about that sort of lush, naturalistic planting, whether it's ferns or rhododendrons. Uh, you want that sort of sense of exotic, whether it's um, perhaps more hardy exotic, if you like. And that idea, I, I think that idea where you've got a space in the garden that could be informal, but you can start to have a little bit of a, a tour of the world, if you like, from the plants that you can start to choose to put in that garden space. So. Not particularly a sort of Victorian idea, but they like to have geographical collection. But I think these days it's also kind of educational and kind of fun to not to say this is the China corner and that's the Japan corner and this is the European corner, but to to have this richness of plants uh, within within a garden space if you've got the climate that you can grow them uh, and almost take a sort of global tour through the, the world's flora uh, through a sense of beauty, but also a sense of 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 interest, if you like, just to show the diversity of the world's world's flora. No, we're we're getting a very good start on this lower woodland garden, and and finally we 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 have Hermitage in there, and I, I love your idea of the root house. I, I think we we could just turn the page with that, but but give me a couple more ideas that that might help with thinking about a a Hermitage in this particular area. Well, the Hermitage was was originally an idea where you had this garden building which was populated was inhabited by a hermit the idea that you know hermits the idea of the the religious uh, person who secretes themselves away in, in personal study it became a sort of fashion in the i guess the sort of first half of the 18th century in the english landscape the one here is uh, from stowe uh, a famous english landscape garden and this one actually had a real hermit. Uh, they employed someone who was who was lived in this rather cold little stone thing, and they were supposed to be, you know, bushy beard and sticks in their hair, and they'd come out and go grrr at passers-by when the uh, garden visitors. And as I seem to recall, this one got sacked um, for two reasons. One, he was mostly drunk, which I'm not surprised living in a cold, manky little house like that uh, on his own all the time. But the other reason he got sacked was because he wasn't on his own all the time, which was uh, very much against the hermitage code. But if you didn't have a real hermit, you could also have a stuffed one. I mean, not a real stuffed person, but you'd make a straw model and dress them up. And um, it was a famous English naturalist, Gilbert White, uh, who had a hermitage in his garden. And he used to employ his brother when he had guests over to dress up as a hermit and come out and jump out and scare people. But I mean, it comes a bit, a bit to that idea of, a, of your hoarders conclusives. I can see you could have like a hermitage at the end of your hoarders conclusives where you want to retreat from the world for a while. And, you know, gaze at one's navel and think about nice things but it's it's part of the sort of garden building tradition in the 19th century but um it carried on into the uh sorry into the 18th century carried on into the 19th century but once again it's it's something that could be a, a bit of fun in the in the 21st century but the root one i think might work in a, in a woodland setting like that no i like that very much and and the whole idea of a hermit code if i've learned nothing else today i, I have something else to investigate so, so stepping away um, from the lower corner of the garden, more into almost the dead center of the property below the walled garden is an area that we've been calling the switchback meadow. Um, it's still more of a weed collection at the moment, but it's a, an area we're anxious to start playing with. And you can see here, it, it fits several of your concepts from the book as well. Um, this image shows, you can see the vista descending the stairs toward the river on the right, just to give you a bit of context. And then on the left is the interior of the old carriage trail where the, the carriage trail does a switch back. Um, you can see we've cut some access through the overgrowth there. There are some native plants that we've got to go in there, but we're still looking at mostly invasives from this particular shot. Um, We've also let some of the, the turf in the past year that was immediately next to the walled garden in the lower terrace in this in this balustrade, um, in the parapet, 
grow and we're trying to cultivate uh, more native things and, and less invasive things here. Although I do see a, a couple pieces of mugwort um, across from this beautiful and one of the largest Kusa dogwoods that I'm familiar with in this particular area. Um, but I'm curious, especially as a meadow is sort of a, a native North American concept, what your perspective on a meadow is, Toby? I think it's one of those things that's kind of evolved, um, certainly in Europe in, in the 20th century, the idea that the meadow is, I mean, the ancestry is way, way back as a place where you'd graze uh, livestock, but the idea of using it as a garden feature is primarily driven these days as a combination of aesthetic, but also wildlife gardening, that idea of, of growing natives, uh, or at least those plants that have a, 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 an insect benefit to, to the biodiversity. But there's a whole range of, of, of related issues that come around the meadow. I think that you can probably draw a thread back to uh, another medieval idea, which is the flowery mead, which this is a feature I think this is a lovely one, and one of the things in the book was this idea of taking some, was to introduce some of these historic features which we've been talking about so many uh, today, and then kind of seeing how you can dust those off and bring them back. I Probably not many people uh, watching this have, have heard of the flowery mead, but this idea if you take a fine grass meadow or a piece of fine fine grass sward, and into that you, you, you plant a lot of different ornamental plants, and it comes up in a lot of tapestry, a lot of medieval painting. Uh, so you end up with this almost like jeweled lawn, if you like. Now, I tried this in our previous garden, and the effect was lovely, but I have not not worked with a garden feature that required more maintenance, because the grass naturally will grow up and swamp everything out. So if you want it, you've got to be on your knees with a pair of, of, of sheep shears, snipping the grass all the time to keep it low so everything else looks wonderful. So that kind of fell out of fashion because it was very high maintenance. And then, you know, several hundred years went by. Then the whole idea of naturalistic planting came in. The whole idea of, you know, ecology started to happen. Uh, and in Germany, particularly in the 30s, there was a sort of quite a strong push towards national nationalistic uh, planting, partly driven by the Nazi party, in fact. Uh, so that idea of meadows of using your own plants then sort of comes in the prairie garden into North America, which I have to say was one of the pioneers was a Dane, uh, Jens Jensen, particularly in the Midwest, and this idea of using the natural landscape as an inspiration and the natural plants as an inspiration, um, and also the natural features, so lakes and water and what have you. The top one there is the Chicago Botanics uh, and a couple of Van Sweden uh, gardens there as well, oh, Van Sweden, uh, the New American Garden. So, and then that comes back into sort of with the meadow. So there's all this idea of sort of a large area of primarily uh, native plants, this idea of encouraging wildlife. And I guess there's a, an extrapolation out to the new perennial movement, which I also would say has more of a sort of uh, a link back also to the sort of GPLS planting in big drifts for, for, imp for impact. But I think if, if in a garden space, if you've got it, again, this idea of trying to improve the wildlife and the biodiversity of an area, and a meadow is a fantastic way of doing that. And it's also a really nice thing to walk through. You know, the first picture of the meadow, you have the tall grasses or whatever, and then you cut your grass paths through. It's, it's a very attractive way to deal with a, a space and also pretty low maintenance as well. It can be. It's, there is some of your flowery mead that still comes into it, and, and, and maintenance will be an issue going forward. But I, I think any of these elements can go into a meadow. I think any of these meadow ideas can be pulled out and put into a garden. Um, and I think maybe that's what you're looking at with the new perennial movement and all this. But I, I see all these elements sort of commingling that can be thought of on a big ecological scale or be, can be pulled down into a small cultivated garden scale too. So it's a really fascinating, fascinating grouping of ideas, I think, including the native plantings. Yeah. So just below that meadow area with the hopefully native plantings and hopefully low maintenance, um, we have a wetland area. And to describe that a little bit better, um, we're gonna go back to our bog correspondent. So I've made my way down to the terraces just below the walled garden. Um, it's what we jokingly call our invasives display. Um, it's full of mugwort and phragmites and knotweed. And as we've been trying to clean it up, we discovered this area that's quite wet and boggy. And we hope to use this area as a natural bog planting. 
So again, Toby, it's, we're hoping to, we've sort of discovered this area underneath all these invasives when we first got into a rather remote and overgrown spot. And it just seems sort of an obvious thing is rather than to try to drain all that water out or try to figure out a plumbing system is just to use what we had to bring in a whole different ecosystem of plants and a different style of gardening in a bog garden. Yeah, why not? And I mean, what you've been talking about with that whole area with the sort of ornamental woodland and the odd feature, maybe this Yoshiakwa and the, the hermitage and the stumpery mixing in with the sort of naturalistic meadow area in the bog garden, it's all that sort of very naturalistic, informal flowing through that area. I think it will add some beautiful dyna uh, dynamism to the garden. And as you said, a whole range of new, a whole palette of new different types of plants. Once again, very effective, both uh, ornamentally and, and wildlife wise. And it'll be fun to, to move people into to a new part of the garden as well. Just the, there's so many spaces that we we really can't invite visitors into yet. And and one of those spaces that is quite inaccessible um, without much motivation to move into it is an area we're calling. We've given it a working title of either the the pond garden or the quiet garden. So right at the moment it's the quiet pond garden. Um, there's a lot of opportunity for it. And there's a lot of potential that we've mined from your book as well. And I'll go to our last correspondent video and take a look so at that I space. I'm standing just south of the Temple of Love, which you may be able to see in the background. The reason I'm so far away from camera is because I wanted to stand down here in this low part, maybe give some idea to the lens of what the topography is. Um, I'm standing in some mud. This is a very low lying wet area. And we're hoping to turn this into a quiet pond garden, maybe borrowing on Japanese garden styles. Toby, you can help me out with that. But here I am in the shadow of the retaining wall for the old mansion terrace. Um, quite a feature that right now is completely unavailable to visitors. And off to my right and to the west, there may be an opportunity to open up a view to the Hudson as well. So thinking about this quiet pond garden and maybe a Japanese garden was one of the first terms that was thrown around as we were trying to think about what to do here. My feeling is that you can only have a Japanese garden in Japan. Um, so borrowing some of those styles from Japanese garden that give it that feel and translating it into use in this Yonkers garden, which is largely what Untermeyer did throughout his whole creation of the garden. Um, but one of those elements that I strongly associate with Japanese gardens are very characteristic conifers. And maybe that fits into your concept of pinetum. Um, to an extent, I think sort of that that idea of Japanese viewing uh, of strolling gardens where you're walking through and 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 enjoying the vistas and the prospects. Um, in some ways, I, I I totally agree with you that if you want to if you want to enjoy a Japanese garden at its finest, go to Japan. Um, I think in many ways the Untamaya Garden is 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 a pastiche of different lots of different styles, but it kind of works historically, uh, and I like the way it is. I I would be really hesitant about trying to create a Japanese garden, particularly in a, in a woodland area. Um, they can look so bad if they're not. Uh, yeah, I I mean. I, I'm not a huge fan of, of I'm, I'm totally up for the idea of drawing inspirations and creating something that's that's unique to the place, which is what Untermeyer has done with particularly the wall garden. Bit of fun, and I, absolutely. But to sort of create a Japanese garden, to try and imitate a Japanese garden, I, I don't think works. Um, I've never seen one outside Japan that works. Um, I would say that you know if you've got a if you've got a place to to play with some space like that like you have. The idea of a pinetum, again, we were talking about that idea of having as much, you know, a plant collection. The pinetum is exactly that, a collection of conifers from around the world. Uh, and it looks lovely if you have a lake or a pond where you have that reflection. Uh, and if you've then got the borrowed landscape out over to the Hudson, I, I think that would be a lovely way to complement the other sort of naturalistic elements that that you've been talking about in that area of, of the garden. So. You know, those are Japanese gardens. And the thing, if you want to do a Japanese gardens, they look natural, but they're not. Uh, there's so much sort of tweaking, manipulating, pulling leaves off and all this, that and the other. Yeah, want to see a Japanese garden, go to Japan and beautiful and lovely. But, you know, it's not a, I, I think it's one of those very, it's a, 
it's such a cultural form of gardening that it's not just about the elements and the features there's so much more depth to japanese gardens that you know we have trouble understanding uh, as non buddhists and as non sort of uh, japanese so it's it's good to go there and see them and ex have them explained to you um, then you start to really understand the depth of 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 exactly why they are the way they are but just to sort of copy one is yeah nah cross that one off then sure and so what Untermeyer has done and is compile all these various elements um what your book has done is compiled so many elements um folks i gotta tell you we've just scratched the surface of toby's book um every entry is as well illustrated as you've seen um and just as informative and scholarly as you've heard from toby today um and just to wrap things up i, I was curious well, your book is A to Z, so I, I thought we should try to finish on a Z. And Untermeyer in his time, and, and we're nearing the end of our, our allotted time here, was very progressive, was very in tune with the culture. Um, his work reflected that, his, his motivations reflected that, um, and his garden to some extent reflected that as well too. And so I was surprised to see Zeitgeist as a garden element in your book and i know that's talking about the spirit and the mood of the culture at the time and i think untermeyer's garden did that as a renowned garden in the early 1900s and i think it now still serves that purpose in the community and it's situated and the influence it was borrowed from and i was just curious how you would define zeitgeist as a garden element or style I the idea was that uh, I've always said that gardens uh, and particularly garden art is is reflective of its time. Uh, it influences the zeitgeist, the, the the spirit of the age, and it is uh, influenced by it. So gardens are an absolute, in, uh, you know, integral part of our culture. Doesn't matter where or when we we've made gardens, what culture it is, what part of the world, those gardens are part of that time and that place. And gardens change over time. And I absolutely agree with what you're saying that. Um, and to my made his garden was total absolute zeitgeist uh, for that sort of uh, country age, um, and and what I love is the that the garden is evolving. You know, you guys have restored what was was lost and you've brought that back. But you know, this last section we've been talking about is is today's zeitgeist and taking uh, that garden forward for the next generation. And I think that's that's absolutely what should be done with with gardens. They shouldn't be these these um, as I said sort of preserved in aspic. Uh, garden spaces. You can do that with a statue of David because it's a it's a lump of marble. But a garden is a an ever changing organic art form, and as such, should uh, evolve. Uh, otherwise, it kind of loses its meaning. I think. No, thank you. I think that puts it in, in really great context. And and Toby, I can't thank you enough for being involved today. Um, your insight has been invaluable. Working with you has been a pleasure. Um, speaking with you is just plain fun for the two and a half hours has gone by so quickly I didn't even realize um, I do want to hold up to the camera and it's on your slide right now this really is an amazing book it's quite beautiful and scholarly um, there are garden terms and styles in here that I've not heard of um, and certainly have only read of recently um, thanks to Toby's book um, I think there's 209 in complete listings in the book and the illustrations are just gorgeous um, we have a slide up right now if you copy down that code you can go to fade on publishing directly and buy the book at a discount thanks to Toby's involvement here um, I think it's well worth it and again Toby has a huge collection of books um, that should get on your reading list I know they're recently on mine as well so Toby, I can't thank you enough for being with us today. I thank you, Timothy. It's been an absolute pleasure, and, and putting the presentation together has been has been fun. So I've I've really enjoyed uh, our time together. So thank you so much for the invitation. And, and I thank you all. And I see that we did get a decent list of questions. Um, we are right at the end of our time. I just couldn't keep my mouth shut. But I think what we'll do is I'll get those questions, and Toby and I, you can look at those, and we'll get back to the folks. That, that have some questions that need our answers and we'll do that offline with them. Okay, we'll do that, no problem. So thank you all for joining us. Um, come visit us in the garden and 
look up Toby's library of books. Thanks for your time. Thank you. That was awesome. Oops. <laughs> we stopped it. I'm about to.